Okay, folks, uh, welcome back in this uh, course of uh, fundamental principles in Catholic bioethics and the program of bioethics, a master of science in bioethics at St. Thomas University, beginning always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Trinity, we love you, we adore you, we thank you for all your many blessings. Uh, in spite of the difficulties of our life, we know that you are Emmanuel, God with us. Bless our lecture today, bless all our efforts to bring forth your truth and your light and your life to those who surround us. We pray in a special way for those who are in need of your divine mercy at this time. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I always ask any questions from previous material, uh, previous lectures, anything there? All right, just a little Father, bit. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you a minute. I do have one question yes, so concerning the last lecture, the one that was um, replayed. Yes. I didn't quite, I, I read it in, in Mayor, and, uh, but I didn't quite understand the evolution of the doubling effect of the DNA. Oh, yes. That one sequence gets put in between right. the 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 same sequence twice. Right. I, I, what I, what they're trying to explain is that then a random variation occurs and then it becomes a new function. I don't understand how it gains a new function. Right. Very good. Okay. So that's a good very good uh, segue into uh, what we're going to get into. Basically, so DNA is also in a dynamic state. All right, uh, really everything around us, including our own bodies, uh, it's in a dynamic state, it's not really static. It's just that nature in general has the benefit of time and time, geologic time, which we're generally talking about millions of years, all right? So even though for us, it seems like everything is put, stayed in place, in fact, everything is dynamic. Even the very wall that is surrounding me right now there are literally atoms that are being exchanged in this wall, in and out. There's air that's going through the wall and so forth. Uh, so whereas that middle world, everything looks static. In reality, when we get into the macroscopic and the super macroscopic uh, worlds, right? Uh, things are changing all the time, but the time scale is very different from us. Now, that is kind of a, a preamble, just a general statement. With regards to DNA, it is also a very dynamic molecule. Even though it is stable generally, precisely because of the double helix, right? Uh, that the, the bases are paired, the nucleotides are paired, base pairs, mm, it's still a dynamic uh, molecule. And it does very weird things. It folds up on, on itself. It, it splices into itself and changing, interchanging genes. They can change location, et cetera. We'll get more into DNA and genetics uh, in the following course on the beginning of human life. The beginning of human life, again, we do first the biology and then the ethics based on the biology, right? That's uh, how we do natural law and uh, uh, okay. morality. But basically, DNA is a very dynamic molecule that over time uh, and uh, at times uh, by random events can double upon itself and the genes can duplicate in the replication machinery, which is extremely fast. Within seconds, the, the DNA gets replicated or duplicated when the cell divides. And they're called tandem repeats, tandem repeats, all right? And sometimes those tandem repeats if the gene doubles right next to each other, like uh, two adjacent wagons on a, on a train, or sometimes the repeat is not tandem, it goes at another end or at another chromosome of the DNA. And, uh, or sometimes it goes backwards uh, and it becomes what they call a palindrome, where you read it the same, but uh, going forward and backward from the center in either direction. And so it may or may not become functional depending if it has a reading frame of the three bases. Again, I'm getting into too much detail, but it may or may not be functional, all right? Uh, so there's the, the, the interesting combination between chance, 
because mutation in principle is a chance event. You know, it happens that the UV hit or whatever other insult is gonna cause the, the mutation on the DNA at that particular moment, but also that there is a, like a program, it has to work in certain ways, okay? So that we use a wrench for twisting things and we use a, a, um, a uh, screwdriver for, for screwing a screw and those are the proper function of the tools. But sometimes we misuse the tool, right? More than once I've tried to uh, yank out a, a, uh, a screw with a pair of pliers because I don't have a, a, a thing in hand. I don't have a screwdriver on hand. It's awkward, but it could do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you work at it hard enough. So these are things that occur in nature. And it's that combination between what has been determined, what we call deterministic, that nature like works one way, you know, the, the digestive system is for digesting, but there's also a chance that sometimes it develops another function. Like for example, the appendix, getting more closer to last uh, lecture, the appendix, which is a vestigial organ, has lost its original function of being another bag, like another stomach for further digestion, further ruminating the cud, and now has developed a secondary characteristic or a secondary function of being involved in the immune system, assisting the immune system. So we use the word opportunistic, right? And nature is that way. Nature is opportune. If something works, nature continues to use it. That's also a good argument for DNA itself. It seems like, I mean, it's quite obvious now in hindsight that DNA is the fantastic molecule uh, for holding inheritance, for holding information, right? Because it, it, it seems to have developed early on back to about 4 billion years ago, ever since we have an actual organism, some fossil record, which I'll show you today of, a, of an organism, of a primitive organism uh, here on earth, we see that pretty much they are reproducing, they're passing on the genetic information from one generation to the next through the molecule of DNA by using mechanically, mechanically using the molecule of DNA. So it is amazing how elegant that molecule is, all right? And if it works, nature doesn't fix it. It continues to use that for these 4 billion years. But there is also a previous world, what is called the RNA world. We, we believe that RNA was prior to DNA. A single helix that has started doubling upon itself and stabilizing and so forth. Again, I'll get into that uh, next course in more detail. Mm. But yes, this molecule of inheritance, that's why we say the universal molecule of inheritance, right? Anyway, kind of a long answer for, <laughs> for a quick question, um, but it does segue into today's lecture of origins, mm, origins. Uh, before doing that, just a very brief recap. See what we're trying to do here in this phylogenetic course, right? The origin of the human species as a whole, or at least the human genus mm, is both on the science and on the faith. We want to be uh, faithful. We want to be true to both our knowledge of objective fact in front of us and we also want to be true to our beliefs, to our Judeo-Christian beliefs that we are indeed created in God's image, right? So that uh, tasks us, that gives us, uh, leaves us with a task of reconciling science with religion or science with faith anyway, in a harmonious way so that it doesn't do violence to either one. So we don't end up rejecting either uh, evolution or rejecting uh, creation. <laughs> right, so the first half of the course, the first part of this course is basically presenting the evidence for evolution in some level of detail, of course, uh, the evidence for evolution as a biological process that occurs in nature. And as far as we can tell has occurred in every organism that we see living today, every species ourselves included because biologically we have a body. We are an organic body and our bodies are not exempt from evolution. You know, that would be unrealistic. That is fantastic. That is a uh, fantastic in the negative sense. That is like thinking that we are exempt from evolution. 
and what would what would mm, try to lead us there it would be a, a wrong understanding of our faith that uh, you know God is creator, but we have to understand how how is God created? All right. So this uh, first part of the course is presenting that evidence for the evolutionary process. And the most obvious evidence that we have there, first is the fossil record, which already for centuries, these, these fossilized, uh, this mineralized bones have been around, they're there. Obviously uh, they are not uh, just a piece of a, a mountain or something like that. They, that was a living organism at some point <laughs> to make that structure. Mm -hmm. But also the print can also be considered a fossil, right? And also when they're in case, usually small um, or insects or other uh, small animals encased in what we call amber, which is essentially resin from pine trees, ancient pine trees, mm -hmm. ancient conifers. And beyond that, there is also comparative embryology, comparative embryology, right? The words are important and have meaning. Also, so centuries already, uh, scientists were comparing. They noticed uh, just simple observation that the earlier embryonic stages are more similar just in what we call gross morphology, G-R-O-S-S, -S, gross morphology, the general morphology, right? The, 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 like the outer shape of whatever we're looking at was very similar in different species across the board. And the closer the species, the more similar that morphology was. For example, different birds, all birds. And then backing out from there, different reptiles, but all reptiles and so forth. So that's the other line of evidence. Uh, then the um, molecular uh, evidence, which is really the more um, accurate one and the more detailed one, because obviously, as the word says, now we're down at the level of molecules, DNA, highlighting DNA, the fact that uh, uh, this is the universal molecule of inheritance, right? If God is creating uh, just individual species here and there without any connection uh, between them at all, first of all, why make them all, why make them similar, right? Instead of just making very different species all together without any even, mm, similarity to each other, and why having DNA for all of them, right? Because if there's really uh, just the, well, that would only justify the inheritance of that particular, the, um, that particular uh, species. But the percentage homology, the percentage homology also is pointing backwards, right? The, the challenge here is that we're looking backwards in time, is pointing toward a common ancestor. In other words, it makes sense. If the common ancestor is there, then it makes sense what we're seeing today in the biodiversity and so forth. So these are the main lines of evidence for, for the evolution. Uh, now, we're going to circle back into origins for a moment. Uh, look very, very briefly at the origin of the universe. Again, we're gonna look at it in more detail when we look at the environmental bioethics course. We'll pick up there again on the origin of the universe. Uh, we're gonna go into more detail. This lecture is primarily on the origin of life as such, the origin of life on earth about 4 billion years ago, just under 4 billion years ago from some fossil records that we have, which is just spectacular, amazing. Mm. And then finally, the origin of humans a little further down the line on the lectures, uh, the actual genus, I'll get just to the bottom line here on the, on the outline that I sent you. The, at the level of homo, right, genus, is uh, two to three million years ago, two to three million years. So we started with a scale of the universe of about 14 billion years, more or less, 14 billion years. Let me just make this a little bigger. Approximately 14 billion. Again, keep in mind that uh, the American billion is 10 to the nine, right? So it's a thousand million, but the European billion is 10 to the 12, meaning that it's a million million. <laughs> in other words, this number is so humongous, 
that if we don't even, we're not even uh, together, you know, on what to call it, <laughs> okay? So that's why you, we use the scientific notation. But uh, so the billion that we're referring to here is the American billion, close to 14, which is the, uh, what is popularly known as the Big Bang. Again, we'll get into that in more detail when we get into the environmental course. Uh, now the earth itself, which means the planetary system, our solar system with the sun and the four inner planets and the four outer planets and so forth. And then the micro planets that are also around uh, about four and a half billion years. So we can see that we're relatively in the last third of the age of the universe, barely in the last third, okay? And then within that four and a half billion years, of course, uh, the whole earth started as a ball of uh, molten magma. Well, why don't I go into the presentation? <laughs> Show you some graphics, some visuals. And this process is called accretion. Accretion is basically an accumulation of particles that are flying around fragments of other planets and other stuff in the universe, matter, material that is flying around at a literally astronomical speed. But when these things collide, they start to conglomerate. And because of gravity, one of the four fundamental forces, right? The field at the macro level, then it attracts the more mass one has, the more gravitational pull it is, and it tends to attract more and even more. So that's a process of accretion until what happens is eventually, uh, any planet will start sucking up any material matter that is flying around that is capable of trapping, trapping so that the speed is, is fast, but it's not that fast. It, the gravitational pull is even fa uh, greater, all right? And so basically what it does uh, over time is it clears the area around itself. The planets clear the area around itself of satellites and meteorites and stuff flying around by gravity. And then whatever gets to fly by is either too far away or too fast <laughs> to be trapped by the gravitational field. So it's an interesting process. Again, you see the dynamics of that, right? And uh, sooner or later, our planet will also either fly out into space or collide, be sucked into the sun a few million. Uh, it's estimated that we're about halfway that our planetary system is halfway. It's in middle age. <laughs> it's in middle age. So <laughs> here we are in the middle age crisis, right? One after the other. Finally, the uh, origin of humans, as I say, the various species of the genus Homo two to three million years ago. All right, let's back down into the um, origin of the universe. It's the, the the solar system, meaning our planet. We can trace it to four and a half by uranium half-life. Uranium half-life, which actually has, as far as we can tell, the longest half-life uh, on the planet, right? And this is because we find graphite in, uh, in embedded in zircon crystals. So this is a zircon crystal. That's the actual crystal there. You can see it's a crystalline formation, right? It's geometric. And these zircon crystals have entrapped in them. So they're dirty crystals. They're not clean crystals. Embedded in it, some of the black stuff in there is graphite. And graphite contains carbon. That's why it's black. But graphite also contains uranium. Okay, so we can measure the half-life of these guys. And it's been estimated to 3.8 to 4.4 billion years, these uh, zircon crystals. And we believe that these are some of the earliest uh, crystals formed on earth when the earth was just basically beginning to cool enough to have a crust, to have a crust around it after the magma phase, which again, being molten lava, the liquid and the dense liquid, it's also moving around, all right? Only in geologic time. Okay, so let's get more into the life itself and the origin of life. The biological evidence is these uh, stromatolites. Stromatolites, 
the word comes from layering, uh, stroma, right? Now, this is uh, down in the South Pacific in Australia. It's called Shark Bay. Uh, you can imagine why. And these boulders that one sees on the coastline, right? These boulders here, this is a cross section of one of those boulders. We see all these layers, these layers, sedimentary layers, but when looked at them microscopically, it turns out that scientists have figured out that these layers are made up of bacteria or archaea, all right? Because they have actually organic compound deposits. And when we mention organic compounds, we mention life because they are the ones that make life. In other words, remember the four organic compounds, uh, that are the proteins, the lipids, carbohydrates, and um, uh, DNA, the, the nucleic acids. Mm -hmm. So when we find these organic compounds, we can deduce that life has been there because they are the product of, of life. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that make up life. So it's interesting that these uh, stromatolites have been dated precisely to 3.8 to 4.3 uh, billion years ago. Okay. So it kind of coincides with the beginning of the crust on Earth. So pretty much as soon as Earth developed a crust, it cooled enough to have water in a liquid state, in a liquid uh, state, as opposed to vapor, which there's still, imagine this, the magma, the lava that is- Father, can you repeat that please? The crust of the Earth. Yes, when when uh, planet Earth cooled, became cool enough, cold enough, cool, not cold, but cool enough to develop a solid crust, because the magma is liquid, right? And how do we change states, either by pressure or temperature? So in this case, it's temperature. We are we. I mean, planet Earth, like any other planet, and even the the Sun is giving off heat, it's diffusing heat entropy into the universe. So we are gradually cooling down. The earth is cooling down. The sun is cooling down. Everything is cooling down gradually by losing heat, dissipating heat into the universe. It's called entropy. So when the earth cooled enough to have a crust solid, right? Also, that means that water was able to uh, liquefy, liquefy. Of course, we're very far, at this stage, we're very far away from ice, right? Which requires an even cooler temperature. But at least the crust was cool enough so that some water vapor started liquefying and eventually became the oceans. So we had these pools of water on the surface of the earth, on the crust of the earth, which is what we call the oceans, <laughs> quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. So all this water, uh, started accumulating, which by the way, also we trap a lot of water molecules from the universe, like a sponge. I'm getting too much into the environmental uh, bioethics course here. Um, it's hard to refrain from giving detail, I'm sorry. At any rate, the point here is that these stromatolites are considered to be layers of bacteria or archaea that go back 3.8 to 4.3 billion years ago, again, by some of the carbon and some of the uranium that uh, mostly the uranium, trace uranium that has been found in them. I mentioned archaea and bacteria, but now I want to go into a little more detail so that you understand uh, what's happening here and why archaea are considered to be more primitive bac bacteria, but kind of the precursors of bacteria. First of all, they're prokaryotes meaning that they don't have an organized nucleus. We'll get a little more into that in a minute. But basically, karyo. So this is what I say, the added value of the course and the whole program is that you pick up a little Latin and Greek along the way, okay? Not that I speak Latin or Greek, but in science, we also pick it up. And then in theology, we also pick it up and in philosophy. Anyway, from the Greek, karyon, karyon means uh, nucleus. In fact, the word nucleus comes from there somehow, derivated. 
And pro, it means that it doesn't have really an organized nucleus with membranes, that the DNA or the RNA is not enclosed in a membrane, what we call the nuclear membrane or what we call the nucleus of the cell, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But basically, uh, prokaryotes are the ones that don't have an organized nucleus uh, with the DNA enclosed or RNA, but rather there is a concentration of DNA or RNA, but um, it's not enclosed in a membrane. So those are the prokaryotes and the prokaryotes are two of the three domains. Remember the domains, the largest uh, classification of living organisms, the archaea and the bacteria. The basic difference between these two creatures is just one layer in between the sandwich of what makes the cellular membrane, the cellular membrane, All right? So I'm talking about the membrane here. Okay, these guys are super microscopic. These are augmented in the thousands of uh, magnification. So definitely we're in the micro world here. So you see that the bacteria cell wall has three layers, right? But the archaea are missing this middle layer here. That is a layer made up of uh, peptides, but the glycan is a compound, it's a complex compound that's got the uh, proteins and lipids and so forth. This middle layer is missing in the archaea, but it is in the bacteria. And so that's why it's considered that archaea are more primitive. And eventually when some archaea develop that middle layer, they became bacteria. And that's why they're called archaea. Archaic means something ancient, the most ancient. So of the three domains, the archaea, the bacteria, and then the eukarya, the eukarya are the ones that, uh, just so for the spelling, right? Eo means true or real. So cario, again, is a reference for the, uh, for the nucleus. Eo means true or real. So we got archaea, bacteria, and then all the other living organisms that typically are multicellular, but some are still unicellular. Those are the eukarya. All right, let's go uh, forward. That's the first thing. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the archaea because we still have archaea on right. Earth today. I have a question, Father. Here, Please. yeah. Do you? Uh, I don't know if I understand well. Do you say the archaea in its evolution become the bacteria, right? Yes. Some archaea evolve into okay. bacteria when they develop this middle layer on their cell wall. Okay. Some archaea became bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. There's a divergence there, right? There's a node. But some archaea, other archaea remained as archaea, never developed this layer because we have archaea today, a few, not many, but they are archaea on earth today. So these creatures have actually lived for about 4 billion years, a little more than 4 billion years, which is amazing, fascinating. Of course, not the same individual bacteria, right? That is an individual archaea, but progeny, descendants of descendants of descendants. They have been around for as long as there has been life on earth. If these guys could talk, imagine what they would say. <laughs> okay, so, so you Sorry. see why they're more primitive, the archaea are more primitive because they're missing a layer. In other words, you can already see here that increasing complexity are going to be more recent organisms. Saying that in the reverse is, more simple organisms are more primitive. So jellyfish are more primitive than mm, worms and worms are more primitive than chickens, <laughs> okay? Because chickens have much more specialized structures like feathers and flying than worms. And worms have much more specialized uh, structures than jellyfish. So increasing complexity means that those are more recent, more evolved organisms. 
And that's the proper term. Evolution has occurred. So basically what I'm trying to say with all this discourse is that there has been evolution between the archaea and the bacteria just by developing this middle layer on the cell wall. The rest inside is pretty much the same. There's a DNA uh, plasmid or chromosome, there's a cytoplasm, uh, the ribosomes for producing the uh, respiration, cellular respiration, which means metabolism and so forth. Okay, and going forward, just stop me anytime, okay? If you have a question or a comment. Now, I mentioned that archaea is still around today and they are very audacious. Of course, they started, these archaea started in the primitive uh, atmosphere, right? When things were very toxic, it just basically a crust, uh, but still very hot toxic fumes, the primitive atmosphere, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, was very different from the current atmosphere. And so they're called extremophiles. Again, now this is for the Latin philia, which is love or friendship, okay? Uh, or brotherhood. Uh, file is love for, and extremo, of course, it's the extreme. So these guys love extreme conditions. For example, halophile, halo is, or halo is a reference to salt, extreme salt, as for example, in the Dead Sea in uh, Israel, that has a salinity that is about 10 times more salty than, uh, than the oceans. The, the Dead Sea is so salty that nothing lives in, in there except bacteria or archaea. Uh, it's so salty that it's dense. It's like baby oil, it's thick, all right? So extremophiles, halophiles love to live in that salty environment. If you take them out of that salt environment, they die because they uh, adapted early on to that environment. Other extremophiles are thermophiles. Again, thermo, a reference to thermometer, to temperature. As for example, bacteria that live in the water that spews out of geysers or geysers. How do you say that in English? Geyser or geyser? Like uh, Old Faithful there in- uh, Geyser. Geyser. Okay? Geyser. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, geyser like in uh, Yosemite National Park, right? Spectacular. Uh, that was the, the flagship national park uh, for Roosevelt in, in the system. Anyway, that water is coming out practically at, at uh, vapor temperature, very close to vapor, all right? And there are bacteria that live and love that hot water. They're called thermophiles. Other ones live in extremely dry environments in the desert. They're called xerophiles, <laughs> zero water, okay? And others actually love radiation. They love to be hit by UV. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> and so these are radio resistant. There's some that even are called poly extremophiles. Poly extremophiles are these archaea that actually love boiling salt water <laughs> that is bombarded with ultraviolet radiation, for example. All right. Now, these poly extremophiles are, oh, it's down there, look at that, <laughs> are very interesting. Why? Because what if we go to another planet like Mars, where the conditions are extreme as far as we're concerned, you know, it's normal for Mars, but it's extreme for us, where the atmosphere is so thin that UV radiation is constantly bombarding the surface of Mars. And maybe salt, is, I mean, water is there, but it's under the surface and um, it's extremely loaded with minerals and therefore very salty. Well, we take some of these poly extremophiles and plant them or propagate them or let them loose in another planet. It's called terraforming, terraforming another planet, making another planet like Earth. How's that for an ego? Of course, it's not gonna happen in our lifetime, right? 
terraforming. It's trying to make another planet like ourselves, where eventually a few million years forward or billion of years, we don't know how long, uh, maybe life will develop there too. Well, if we insert life, of course, we're giving a jump start. <laughs> it will be interesting to see what develops from there. The ethical question is, do we have a right to do that to another planet? Who knows? It's very speculative, right? But uh, we can do it. Should we do it? Open question. Anyway, uh, so these poly extremophiles that exist in our planet today, by the way, the, the labs that work with these extremophiles and poly extremophiles are high containment labs because we don't know what's going to evolve from here if we let it out loose in the middle of a city or something like that. Okay, so they could be extremely dangerous. We just don't know. So these are high containment labs. They're called P4, it's the highest level of uh, containment. P4. Too much detail. Let's get back to uh, cyanobacteria. So, first of all, we have a passage from Archaea going back. First, we discover remnants of Archaea that date back to about 4 billion years ago through the uranium uh, radio dating from hard life. Okay, so we have evidence uh, of these guys around 4 billion years ago or their ancestors. We also see a possible evolution from archaea to bacteria. The next step is from bacteria to cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria. So a process called endosymbiosis, which we'll look at in a little bit. But basically cyano is the color, which is blue green. If I ask you, what is this color here? I hope you can see the little arrow that I'm moving around. Go down a little bit. This is an actual micro photograph, right? It's a photograph taken by a microscope, a light microscope. These are cyanobacteria. If I ask you, is this color blue or green? Half of you will say blue and the other half will say green. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, basically that color is called cyan, blue green. In fact, when I was studying biology back in the seventies at FIU, these were actually classified as algae because 50 years ago, we had not studied in detail the cyanobacteria and had not realized yet that they were actually bacteria and not algae, okay? But they, and, and they were classified as algae because they photosynthesize, which most bacteria do not photosynthesize. They're heterotrophs, they feed, in fact, they're decomposers, right? They feed on organic material. They don't make their own organic material as in photosynthesis, but these guys do. So they are bacteria and they photosynthesize, which is rather unique and interesting and fascinating because also they evolved, they appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. So we go from archaea about 4.3 billion years ago to bacteria sometime after that, and in less than a billion years, in half a billion year, we now have some bacteria that actually photosynthesize. So again, geologic time. But in that geologic time, these cyanobacteria evolve enough to photosynthesize. This is an actual photograph, a micrograph of the uh, cyanobacteria. The individual cells that form colonies, these little springs, or um, yeah, threads, you can see them here, okay? And these little green dots in, inside the cell are the uh, chloroplasts that they use for uh, photosynthesis. Now, sorry, not chloroplasts as such, but equivalents. In other words, they have photosynthetic pigments. They have photosynthetic pigments to be able to do this process of photosynthesis. Why am I harping on this? Because photosynthesis takes CO2 from the atmosphere, takes H2O from the land, and combines these two molecules into making an organic compound we call glucose, a carbohydrate, sugar. And sugar is the energy molecule of the cell 
of the living cell. Therefore, sugar is the energy molecule of the organism. Carbohydrates, the carbs. The carbs are the energy for organisms to metabolize, meaning to live. So we need carbs to stay alive. The carbs are made by producers, by uh, plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. But the cyanobacteria were first because they're bacteria, they're more primitive. Again, this is important because the primitive atmosphere was very different from our current atmosphere and very toxic. There was no oxygen to begin with, uh, but more significantly, there were large quantities of CO2, methane, ammonia, and even hydrogen, diatomic hydrogen, H2, which is also highly explosive. So bottom line, the primitive atmosphere was pretty explosive, even after accretion and after the generation of the crust of the continents, right? There was still a lot of volcanic activity occurring because of the plate tectonics and uh, break up uh, the formation, these, these tectonic plates were moving back and forth on top of the surface of the magma. And so it was a very uh, inhospitable environment in general. However, because of tenacity of life, these guys, the bacteria, who evolve into cyanobacteria are actually start to absorb the CO2 and absorb the water that's available and making this molecule, the glucose molecule, which is energy, uh, chemical energy available for other organisms can, that cannot make their own energy. And also as a byproduct, as a byproduct of photosynthesis, something that is discarded by the cyanobacteria and the algae and the plants is oxygen, O2 oxygen, O2 oxygen. So that changes the atmosphere. In fact, it's estimated that in four and a half billion years, the atmosphere of the earth has changed about four times, significantly, from a very toxic atmosphere to a benevolent atmosphere benevolent for life, amicable. So that's enough oxygen. It's about 16% oxygen right now in the atmosphere. And most of it is nitrogen. N2, have we talked about the atmosphere yet? It's about three fourths of the atmosphere of the air that we're breathing right now is uh, nitrogen, N2, uh, diatomic. And when it's nitrogen gas at standard uh, temperature and pressure, it comes in and out of the lungs. It does nothing, it's called inert. So we just breathe it in and out. Uh, I'm talking about nitrogen, N2, and it's inert, doesn't do anything. When it gets into the blood system under pressure, that's a different story. That can cause embolisms, that can cause blood clots, and it's a, it's a, a very dangerous situation. But as gas, just in and out of our lungs at standard pressure, at one atmosphere of pressure, no problem. Oxygen, of course, we use for metabolism, for cellular respiration, which is the other, the complementary reaction of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis uh, takes CO2 plus water and makes glucose plus oxygen, and cellular respiration goes the other way around. Takes glucose, carbohydrates, burns them with oxygen, and the product of that is we produce carbon dioxide, O2, and also water, water vapor, which we exhale through the lungs. We actually exhale water vapor through the lungs. So for example, if I do this, you see how it gets foggy? That fog is water vapor that just came out of our lungs. So I got a little tiny dehydration there, losing water as vapor from our lungs. So cyanobacteria are important because they produce oxygen and Imagine there was so many, these cyanobacteria, they reproduce, I mean, under ideal conditions, uh, bacteria duplicate on average every 20 minutes, right? So you have three generations of duplication in one minute, I'm sorry, in one hour. In one hour, you have three generations of bacteria and it's a geometric progression. Again, follow a geometric progression is, um, so linear progression, final, linear progression is just, Sequential, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, to infinity. That's a linear progression. And that will, if we graph that, it will give you a straight line. 
but a geometric progression is doubling the amount. So from one, double of one is two. A double of two is four, not three, all right? So double of two is four. Double of four is eight. 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, right? So you see for every generation, if we double the number for every generation, what we get is known as a uh, geometric progression. And when we graph that, we get a log phase. We get a curve upward very fast, very fast. So within a few hours from one bacterium, we end up with millions of bacteria. Run it forward a few more generations, we get trillions of bacteria. And then gazillion bacteria, <laughs> just in a matter of days. Okay, so again, geologic time being in favor of the cyanobacteria in very little time, relatively speaking, in a few million years, they cover the surface of the earth. So much so that they transform, literally transform the atmosphere of the earth toward benevolence or toward, I mean, we say benevolent today because we can breathe it. But basically, it meant that it is setting up the stage for the possibility of more biodiversity of now animals, in other words, organisms that cannot produce their own food. They need food from the plants or from the cyanobacteria, whatever. And so it's a double benefit. These guys, meaning the cyanobacteria and later the algae, not only change the atmosphere into something that can be breathed, but also become food for the animals, right? So uh, the animals, we benefit twice from eating the plants and also from the oxygen that the plants are producing, mm -hmm. double benefit. Now, the next step is what we call compartmentalization, a big word. Let me put it somewhere here. Oops, yeah, oh, that's not where I want to go. Compartmentalization, oh, that's a mouthful. Hope you can see it. So again, making compartments to make a compartment, which is to make a box, you know, a dedicated area or region within the cell. So we already have a cell. By the time we have uh, archaea, we have a cell, bacteria, cell. So we have a cell, meaning enclosed by membrane. And then within that cell, there are pockets. So a compartment is just a fancy word for a pocket. What happens with pockets, which, by the way, before we go to the function, let's look at the structure itself. Here is one bacterium, which I got the name somewhere here. Gemata obscuriglobus, obscuriglobus, yes. This bacterium, actually, what happens is because the membrane, the cell membrane is a double membrane, right? Or in this case, triple being a bacteria, triple membrane. The inner layer of the membrane starts folding in and you can see it here very literally how the inner membrane folds in and makes another pocket. Here's another part, the inner layer, not the inner membrane, but the inner layer of the membrane folds in and makes another pocket. So we end up with these compartments, these pockets. What is interesting about this is that then these pockets can start developing their own function. And the function of this pocket here may be a little different from the function of this other adjacent pocket and so forth. They're gonna have some common functions, basic, what we call basic or basal metabolism, right? Because metabolism is staying alive, but also they can have some specialized functions, okay? And so this pocket here may be involved in digesting the food that the bacterium traps, and this other pocket may be involved in mm, throwing out, expelling the waste, the metabolic waste of metabolism and so forth. So compartmentalization allows for specialization. Another one of these pockets could eventually entrap the DNA and guess what? End up with a nucleus. 
a true membrane where the DNA is encapsulated into a membrane that now protects it. There's some evidence of that or some rather the, um, the elucidation that eukaryotes can develop from prokaryotes by this process of compartmentalization because the nuclear membrane is also a double membrane. It's a double membrane that is very similar to the cell membrane. That's the nuclear membrane, okay, very similar. And so it's logical to deduce that the nuclear membrane developed from the cell membrane, like a pocket that enclosed the DNA for protection. So that leads me into looking at the cell itself. All right, so let's look at the cell. By this process of endosymbiosis, I'm going to explain to you in a minute. Uh, fa fa Father. Yep. Sorry, would you mind going back for a moment? <laughs> okay. okay. So what you're saying is this, uh, the darker part of that cell, is that the nucleus? No, this is, the, this is the bacterium as a whole. This is the whole bacterium. Hold on, let me just get my graphics together here. Okay, so this is the whole bacterium. This is one bacterium. Mm -hmm. One bacterium, unicellular, single cell, uh, living, metabolizing by itself. This is an actual photograph. It's a micro photograph. Here's a scale. There are other like itself next to it, as you can see here in the photograph. So we're looking at an actual living thing that has been photographed. And you can see very clearly that it has these pockets, okay? So this is some kind of uh, indirect evidence of this process that we call making compartments, compartmentalization. I'm trying to give you some evidence for developing a nucleus. In other words, from going from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have a concentration of DNA, the bacteria, but they don't have a nucleus as a whole, an organized nucleus. Eukaryotes do. It's the third domain, right? The third of the big, remember back in lecture one, the three main domains of life, organic life. How do we make that so we can see a progression from archaea to bacteria to eukaryotes? This progression can be explained by the process of compartmentalization, specifically of the nucleus, of the DNA, sorry, of the DNA. And that could account for making a nucleus. But Father, I, I think the question is for this particular bacteria, the Gemata obscura lobus, yep. is that a nucleus? No. Or is that just a conglomeration of Thank the you. membrane? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much, yes. So this is a bacterium, right? By right. definition, bacteria are prokaryotes. They don't have a nucleus. They have a concentration of DNA, but they don't have a nucleus. So bottom line, this guy is not, this is not a nucleus as such. It's a concentration of DNA, but I'm using this bacterium as an example of how a nucleus could have evolved by the compartments, by the infolding of the inner membrane, of the inner layer of the membrane, of the cell membrane, to form the nucleus. But no, this is not a nucleus as such, because this is a bacterium, it's still a prokaryote. But it is heading in the right direction, if you will. We can say that this is a highly evolved bacterium. It's a highly evolved bacterium. Okay. So it probably, uh, would be very close to the node of where the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes diverge. This, this bacterium probably goes back very close to that node, but before the actual divergence. So we can say in a sense is what we call a living fossil, you know, something that is very primitive that has kept its basic characteristics uh, ever since. I do have a question based on this particular. Do we know the timeline of appearance of this particular type of uh, bacteria? Uh, I don't know it. Um, 
I don't know it personally. It'd be interesting to see, but uh, my guess is that it's very primitive. Okay. Right. So, but I, I don't. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, I didn't go into that. <laughs> I was just looking at it for the purpose of the compartments of the pocket. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to date it, right? And to see probably by percentage homology on the DNA sequence. Oh, that's a good one. That's true. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is at the cell itself, because the cell member is a unit of life. Right? The cell is a unit of life, just like the atom is a unit of uh, the stable unit of matter. Okay, but not all matter is living. But the living matter, the stable unit is the cell. Now, most organisms are multicellular, but some organisms are still unicellular, as in the case of bacteria. Even so, typically unicellular uh, organisms congregate, cluster, and make colonies, even though they maintain their relative independence, but they generally also colonize. Right? So it's pointing toward a tissue, which is a cluster of cells that have a similar function. Now, we need to look at this uh, theory of endosymbiosis, endosymbiosis. Symbiosis is a reference to some common task common task or some common function. Endo is within. So just like ecto is going outside, endo is going in, within. And this is the standing theory, the current theory of how uh, cells inherited or developed, evolved uh, three main organelles, three main organelles the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the chloroplast. These three main organelles are kind of the minimum requirement to have a eukaryote, to have a eukaryote. Uh, so let's take it one step at a time. First of all, organelles. Our bodies have organs, right? Liver, heart, brain, et cetera, et cetera. So our bodies are made up of organs. Organs that come together with similar function, they make systems, organ systems. So that we have the nervous system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, et cetera. Organs themselves are made up of tissues. Tissues with similar functions, they form organs. And tissues are made up of cells. So we have that hierarchy of the organism, starting with cells, Cells with similar functions, they make tissues. So we have skin cells coming together, they make the epidermis, they make the, the skin tissue. Then tissues coming together, tissues with a similar function, they come together to form organs, right? We get the, the skin cells is actually the um, epidermis, the outer layer, but then there's a dermis inside underneath, the pink when you get a, when we get a cut or a scratch or something like that, that pink tissue, that's the dermis. And then because it doesn't have melanin, doesn't have pigment. And then below the dermis is even an adipose tissue, which is a fancy word for, for fatty tissue, plus all the capillaries and the hair structures that are there. So all those different tissues coming together, they form the organ. <laughs> and then the organs with similar functions coming together, they form the system, the organ system. Systems coming together form the organism. The only difference is that when we put systems together, each system has a different function instead of similar. So the respiratory system has one function, the nervous system has a different function, the digestive system has a different function. All those systems coming together, now they form the whole organism, a functional living organism. Whether it's a jellyfish or a giraffe or a pine tree. Mm -hmm. So we have this hierarchy of uh, all the way from cells to the organism itself. Everything has to be organized and work in a coordinated fashion, in an orderly fashion to have the actual process of life going on. So back to the cell, which is the basic unit of life. And by definition, they are generally microscopic. Okay? Inside the cell, there are organelles. So just like our bodies have organs, our cells have organelles, 
An organelle is just a reference to a tiny minuscule organ. In other words, functionally, it has some function, but some specific function. So just like the heart does not do what the liver does, and just like the liver does not do what the brain does, each organ in the body has a specific function. Well, the same, the organelles in the cell have specific functions. And three big ones, I mean, there are many, there are dozens of organelles in our cells, but basically the three major ones, the three big ones are these three guys, okay? These three guys really allow for the possibility of eukaryotes, of eukaryotic life, that third domain, which is the most expansive and the most diverse. The nucleus encasing the DNA, the molecule of inheritance, the mitochondria, well, First, chloroplast is, I was talking about photosynthesis. The chloroplast is the organ, the structure, the organelle where photosynthesis occurs. Okay, that's the chloroplast. So we got function and structure, right? The function is photosynthesis, the structure is the chloroplast. Converse to that or complementary to that is the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the structures where respiration occurs, respiration or burning the glucose. But because it occurs within the cell, then it's called cellular respiration. In contrast with the respiration that we do at the level of the whole organism, which is breathing, inhale, exhale, that is organismic re respiration. In other words, the whole, the whole body, the whole organism is breathing in and out, right? But that also occurs at the level of the cell it's uh, a somewhat more sophisticated process. It is the process of burning glucose. And so we call it cellular respiration. That occurs in the mitochondria. Again, the Latin, mitochondria, several mitochondria, one mitochondrion, mitochondrion, I-O-N. That's one mitochondrion, several mitochondria. Just technically. Okay, so here's a representation of animal cell and plant cell. And animals and plants, pretty much the cell basically has the same organelles inside, okay? There's always a nucleus. There's always the uh, mitochondria and other structures there, vacuoles, et cetera, and uh, endoplasmic reticulum and membrane. But in addition, plants have a couple of things, kind of three main uh, structures that animals don't have. First of all, they have a cell wall in addition to a cell membrane. So there's a cell membrane in the animals, there's a cell membrane in the plants, but that's soft. It's like considering a balloon filled with water. The rubber of the balloon is soft, right? It contains the water within, but it's soft. That's the membrane. In addition to the cell membrane, plants also have a cell wall, cell wall here, which is rigid not soft. It's like putting that balloon inside a shoebox. Now it's rigid and we can stack one shoebox on top of the other. Try to stack two balloons, two or three balloons on top of each other without just filled with water. They fall off, right? But if we put each balloon inside a box, now we can stack the boxes. And that's how plants get to be so big because the cell wall maintains the cell rigid. It gives it an outer structure. We don't have that. We animals don't have cell walls, otherwise we'd be rigid, we couldn't move. And so we're flexible because uh, we only have a membrane and no cell wall. All right, so that's one characteristic on the outside. On the inside, we don't photosynthesize, animals don't photosynthesize, so we don't have chloroplasts. That's what makes the plants. So that's another divergence there. When chloroplasts were absorbed, or were ingested into a cell, the primitive cell, that's a node of divergence between animals and plants. Some cells were able to ingest a chloroplast, basically a cyanobacteria, which became the chloroplast. And then that's the origin of plants. Other cells, when they ingested the cyanobacteria, they digested, they ate up the cyanobacteria, so they stayed as animals. <laughs> So that's another node there of divergence between animal and plant. It has to do with having chloroplast or not having chloroplast because functionally that means being able to photosynthesize, 
make our own food or not. However, the mitochondria needs to be there because mitochondria, like I say, is burning the glucose, obtaining the energy released from that glucose, from the carbohydrates, and that energy is used for metabolism, which is another word for being alive. So we have, we animals have mitochondria, but plants also have mitochondria because plants, in addition to making glucose, they also need to stay alive. They need to metabolize. Some of the glucose that plants make, they also burn to stay alive, but they make excess glucose. So it's the net, okay, that is in excess. But plants also use some of the glucose to stay alive and they have mitochondria to burn that glucose and extract the energy. Finally, there's another, there's a third structure. So there's a cell wall, one, there's, a, there's the, um, the chloroplast two, and then the third structure that plants have that generally animals don't have is what is called a vacuole. A vacuole is a bag. It's just, again, a fancy word because we don't like people understanding what we say. So it's a fancy word for a bag. And the bag is typically filled with fluid, water, and it's, it's a way of controlling the amount of water inside the cell and so forth. Okay, that one, that bag is also in a dynamic state. Sometimes the vacuoles contain other substances, but generally it's water and it's a way for plants to maintain turgor, what is called turgor, meaning that, uh, that the plant uh, cell actually has some, some rigidity to it. If the plant cell loses its water, meaning dehydrate, you see how the plant starts wilting, right? Because the vacuole collapses, becomes small, and so it shrivels the membrane will start shrinking and because there are connectors between the membrane and the wall, it actually, the membrane actually pulls in the wall and the plant starts sh uh, shrinking or, or wilting. Mm -hmm. Could you so spell turgor? Yes, uh, pretty much just like it sounds, T-U-R-G-O-R, turgor, turgor, T-U-R. -R. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so turgor is being kind of rigid, pumped up, pumped up, right? Whereas flaccid, flaccid is the opposite word, is uh, less water, kind of dehydrated, or some other fluid that then uh, the structure tends to collapse hmm? or become smaller. Hmm. So basically the vacuole is in charge of maintaining turgor inside the, the plant and keeping the plant upright. <laughs> so we see another kind of node of divergence. Again, we're trying to infer this going backwards, right a few million years ago, where uh, the chloroplast or the cyanobacteria was successful in not getting digested once it was ingested, once it was taken in by some primitive uh, cell. Mm -hmm. And then that could have been the node of divergence for plants versus animals. Uh, next, we have biodiversity, biodiversity. This grab bag that we call the protist, it's a grab bag because it's really not a, re a real phylum. Remember that under, under domain, we have phylum. Then on the phylum, we have class, order, family, et cetera, right? So the next big group under domain will be the phyla, about two dozen phyla, maybe three dozen, depending on how they're classified. But basically in the, uh, the protist is a grab bag. It's a general, it's like a grocery cart where you put stuff from all different phyla in there. But the general characteristic of the protists is that typically they're unicellular. And because they're unicellular, they're also microscopic or sometimes they're colonial. They Are they selfie? Uh, colonies, all right? Like the uh, algae, for example. Right yes. there. Question. I'm asking the link that you put in the um, life before, on the slide before, it is to, this one? This, this leg, this leg, yes. Yeah, oh, the link, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, yes. Yeah, that actually explains the process of endosymbiosis. So let's take a look at that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's a, so I have uh, um, some little films that I'm showing you, some little videos here. Let's see, hopefully I'll be able to do this directly. These little videos uh, show this process, so this, is going to illustrate the process of endo endosymbiosis. Here we go. 
Thank you for that. Okay, hold on. I have to do a little technical trick here to go to optimize for video clip. Here we go. All right. And now this, hopefully you'll be able to hear it also. Although we start at the beginning, it's about four minutes. If you do not hear it, let me know or see it. Ah, how about I turn on the volume? A chloroplast. They're found in hold on, hold on. cells. Hold on. And we know that. Back, wait. Okay, so remember cyanobacteria. And we'll go to look inside of eukaryotic cells, we see membrane-bound organelles. And some of these membrane-bound organelles are particularly interesting. For example, here is a diagram of a chloroplast. They're found in plant or algal cells. And we know that this is where the photosynthesis takes place. But what's really interesting, above and beyond that, is that it seems that chloroplasts have a lot of the machinery necessary for being a prokaryotic cell on its own. We don't see it acting on its own, but it has its own DNA. It has ribosomes, which we know are the site where we go from messenger RNA to protein. Similarly, another interesting membrane-bound organelle that we see in eukaryotic cells, and this would include even animal cells and the cells in your and my bodies, are mitochondria. And mitochondria are often viewed as the energy factories of eukaryotic cells, where we can leverage oxygen in order to produce ATP. And like chloroplasts, mitochondria has its own DNA. It also has mitochondrial ribosomes. Here are some just diagrams of how mitochondria might look inside of a larger eukaryotic cell. And so evolutionary biologists for many decades looked at this and said, well, why do these things exist? Why do they almost look like prokaryotic cells on their own? And there's even examples of prokaryotic cells independent prokaryotic bacteria that live in symbiosis inside of other cells, and they look an awful lot like mitochondria and chloroplasts. And so if we fast forward to the 1960s, someone named Lynn Margulis comes on the scene with endosymbiosis theory. And her view is, is that these membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts, if we go deep into our evolutionary past, say two and a half billion years ago, their ancestors were actually independent prokaryotic organisms that could produce energy aerobically or using oxygen. And precursors to what we would consider today to be modern eukaryotic cells that might have already had some membrane-bound structures like a nucleus and maybe some other things, that they, could only metabolize things anaerobically. They couldn't leverage oxygen. While these other characters could lever leverage oxygen, and then they could have become symbionts, where the one that could leverage oxygen to produce more energy would get engulfed into the larger cell, and that larger cell is able to provide nutrients and protection, while the smaller cell that's engulfed inside of it is able to better metabolize the nutrients and leverage oxygen to produce more energy. And that over time, this symbiotic relationship became even more connected so that the smaller organism could not operate by itself that it lost some of its DNA that was necessary to act independently, and some of it might have gotten incorporated into the DNA of the larger cell. And those smaller organisms are what eventually evolved into what we consider today to be mitochondria. This is a fascinating theory, and it's actually been proven out. When Lynn Margulis first published this in the late 1960s, she wasn't taken that seriously. But in the decades since, it's been validated as we've looked at the DNA structures of mitochondria and chloroplasts, that this actually is the most likely theory of how they emerged in our cells. And so it's just a fascinating glimpse of evolution in general. We talk a lot about natural selection and the role of variation and mutations, but Lynn Margulis introduces another idea that could catalyze evolution, and that's that of symbiosis. And we see symbiosis throughout the natural world. And her argument is sometimes those symbionts beca can become so codependent on each other that they merge into one organism. Okay, let me stop this before it goes on to the next one. <laughs>
All right, so were you able to see and hear that video? Anyone, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we all saw it. Yes, okay. fascinating. Okay. We get here, yes. Very interesting, huh? Uh, this yes, it is. theory of endosymbiosis is by absorbing. It's a type of symbiosis. The other type of symbiosis, I'll tell you, a symbiotic relationship. You've heard of lichens, lichens? Right, lichens is a very interesting example. Typically occur in humid environments. These are lichens of many different types. And you notice they're kind of soft and they look a little bit mushroomy. They have a little appearance like a fungus, but also they're generally green or some variation of green or at least some color they have to them. And that's because they're actually a symbiotic relationship between fungus and algae. And so the fungus, which is more somewhat transparent, uh, allows or provides a liquid environment internally, a liquid environment for the algae because algae need to live in water, need to be immersed in water. And so the fungus provides a liquid environment for the algae and the algae provides sugar for the fungus because the algae photosynthesizes. Mm -hmm. And you can see that when we look at uh, uh, lichens, they look like if it were a single structure, a single organism, but it's actually a very close symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae. Mm -hmm. They both benefit from each other and there's a great variety of, fun of uh, lichens. We'll see lichens also in the environmental course as uh, pioneers for producing soil because they also uh, secrete um, acid which uh, erodes rocks. And they're one of the producers of minerals that eventually may become soil. So very interesting uh, lichens. Whether we lichens or not, they are here to stay. Okay, so we got these protists, grab bag of unicellular or colonial microorganisms. Uh, some photosynthesize, others not. Some are live individually, others form colonies. Some colonies become more and more sophisticated like the algae and different types of algae. There's red algae, there's green algae, there's brown algae, etc. Eventually, if we continue for, oops, step here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this one has to do with forming multicellular organisms, excuse me. <coughs> okay, so here we're going from unicellular to multicellular. And that multicellularity of the more sophisticated organisms is basically by division of labor. Just like we saw earlier by making pockets inside the cell, by compartmentalizing the cell, we could eventually arrive at organelles also by these colonial organisms coming together and forming different structures that are specialized, they can actually uh, move the evolutionary process into what we call multicellularity or organisms like ourselves that have different organs with different functions. Come back here to the algae, for example, this is uh, sargassum weed, which is very prevalent uh, here in South Florida. It comes off the um, sargassum sea, which is also known as the, uh, the uh, what's that called in the middle of the, in the Bahamas, the, the Bermuda Triangle, right? In the Bahamas, the Bermudas, and we're part of the triangle, actually one of the corners. And is this grows so abundantly there that in ancient times when ships were by sail, they would get stuck in there. And so there, the graveyard of the Atlantic is also known, a lot of shipwrecks there, or a lot of uh, um, ships uh, on the bottom. Anyway, sargassum 
is a type of uh, seaweed. It's a uh, brown algae. And some has some structures look like uh, little leaves. They're like leaflets. Hmm? But other structures are little balls that are little balloons that I fill with uh, mostly uh, gases and make the sargassum float. So this piece of sargassum will break away and will float on the top until it starts rotting, turning dark brown, and then it will sink. Okay, but while it's still alive, it will be floating by different structures, these little balls that make it float. So here we see a specialization of uh, structures, division of labor, right, for different functions. So different structures have different functions. At the other end of the algae, typically, there is something called a foothold because they're not real plants in the sense they don't have roots or anything like that. But uh, they do have what is known as a foothold. In other words, at the base, they have something, oops. They have these proteins that develop at the base to grab onto something, to grab onto a rock. And so that is another structure of specialization down here, what is known as the foothold for, for uh, algae, okay? All right, so by division of labor, different parts, we can actually start coming up with an organism that has different structures for different functions. But remember, form follows function, all right? The structure develops according to the function. This one is very interesting. This is known as a Portuguese manoir, Physalia, from the genus uh, Physalia. Again, we have them in the Atlantic. They float around. And typically, what we see is this crest, which is like a little wind sail. This catches the wind, and they will be pushed by the wind, all right? But the tentacles are underneath. And because these are salenterates, these are uh, jellyfish, all salenterates have stinging cells. And the danger with these guys is that you can see the float a little distance, maybe 20 feet from you, but the stinging cells, the tentacles are very long. You see how they're coiled here? See how they're coiled? It's an actual photograph, but uh, they can expand, especially if they trap a fish or something like that. The fish will try to wiggle out and the, the tentacles may expand, but they can also expand with the current. And so the floater is 20 or 30 feet away from you, but the tentacles may be getting close to you if you are down current from <laughs> the Fasalia, from the Portuguese man of war. And when you get stung by this guy, you'll feel it. It's uh, typically a neurotoxin that paralyzes their prey and it's highly toxic and so forth. Anyway, this is an example, very interesting example of uh, division of labor of uh, colonial organisms. This is actually, it looks like a single organism. And whenever anyone will see this or say, oh yeah, yeah, that's a single organism, but it's not a single organism. This is actually a cluster of uh, it's a colony of cells, of tissues, of tissues that have different function, but it's not a single organism. It's a colonial uh, species. So the cells that make up or the tissue that make up the floater here, they have this crest on top of them. And then there's a bag, which typically has uh, CO2. In other words, that's what makes it float. Why is it CO2? Because it's a product of respiration, right? It's a product of respiration or metabolism. So most of the respiration is happening here, just underneath the floater. This mass of cells here, this is where most digestion occurs of the creatures that are trapped, little fish and shrimp or whatever it traps. And so the tentacles catch a fish and they'll coil in the, the, the the tentacles themselves are formed by another part of uh, this colony, other tissue, if you will. And the function is precisely to trap organisms that are moving around. So the tentacles trap a fish and then contract and pull up into this mass of cells here. And this was where, where it's like an external stomach or a stomach that's turned inside out and facing the water, right? 
So the fish is digested here, and the product of that digestion, the burp, <laughs> goes into the bag, the floater, that keeps the whole colony floating. Because if it didn't have a floater, what would happen? This mass would collapse down to the bottom of the ocean, you see, and then it would not be functional. <clears throat> so these different tissues have come together basically, or have evolved this division of labor to make what seems like a single organism, but it's not an actual organism. It's, it's a colony of tissues that have come together to work in unison, just like the lichen to <clears throat> make a functioning structure. All right, so we have evidence even today of colonial organisms of, of uh, division of labor coming together to have a coordinated function of uh, staying alive. We can expand that argument over time, remember? And we come up with the kingdoms. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot the kingdom is in between phyla and uh, domains, right? The <clears throat> three main kingdoms, the three main kingdoms of the, uh, underneath the domain of eukaryote. Remember eukaryote is the large domain. Underneath or the large category, archaea, bacteria, eukarya. Underneath eukaryotes, you have three large kingdoms. Again, three kingdoms, the plants, the fungi, and the animals. Hmm? You see, how the plants were able to make it by sequestering that um, chloroplast through the endosymbiosis theory. The animals diverged out because those other cells, the precursors of the animals did not sequester the, or did not, uh, they digested the cyanobacteria instead of uh, letting it live. And then the fungi, which are also primitive. Uh, they are technically not plants because they don't photosynthesize. So they are consumers, they are consumers, but they are a particular type of consumer called the saprophyte. And again, saprophyte is just from the Latin, uh, maybe some Greek in here, but phyte is uh, philios, again, that they love. And what they love is death dead stuff, carcasses, uh, decay material, rotting, decomposing stuff. Sapro is a reference to death. So they love to feed on decomposing matter. Thanks be to God for the fungi and the bacteria who are also saprophytes, because if it weren't for them, we would just be covered mile high of decayed rotting organisms right, that are just rotting by time, but not by active digestion. And so you can imagine all the organisms that die on a daily basis, they just be sitting there waiting to be decomposed by chemical action, which is much slower. But biological action of decomposition, in other words, the bacteria and the fungi feeding on that organic material, that's much faster than just chemical rotting or chemical decomposition. So we have, again, once we have these three kingdoms established early on, that the divergence into multiple species, multiple groups from primitive plants, like for example, uh, mosses, right? Which could have been an evolution from the lichen. You got fungi, you got the algae coming together. Eventually they start uh, integrating the DNA into a single uh, structure that could become primitive plants like the mosses, which are still dependent on water and so forth, but they are true plants. And eventually the divergence into flowering plants, which are the most evolved, and therefore the most recent group of uh, plants, uh, like this uh, beautiful um, flamboyant, again, that we have in the tropics. On the fungi side, you start with something uh, very simple like colonial uh, uh, fungi like yeast. To this day, yeast are individual cells that come together to form colonies. 
either yeast for for uh, fermenting for fermenting bread or uh, for brewing beer or wine and stuff like that okay all the way to the more complex uh, mushrooms that exist with uh, different structures and different functions uh, certainly macroscopic that can be seen by the uh, naked eye on the animal side, you start with primitive organisms, precisely like salenterates or sea anemones and things like that. Eventually through divergence of biodiversity, and we'll see, we're gonna get into biodiversity now, okay, that process, how it can occur mechanically into some of the more sophisticated animals that we have, which are the mammals in, uh, on earth, on, on the planet and even more evolved after having been on land for a while, they migrated back into the oceans. And I show the whale here because uh, whales, as you may know, uh, all of the marine mammals, all of the aquatic animals, they also have hip bones. And what's the use of a hip bone when one is swimming? Well, none, because the hip bone is used uh, for uh, walking or moving around, okay, on land. <laughs> So that is quite a uh, quite solid evidence that ancestors of, of whales were actually land creatures who wandered into the oceans and eventually through diversity uh, variation, selecting on variation, were able to adapt to, to the ocean, to aquatic uh, living. To this day, Father. all the, give me a minute to just finish sure. the thought. Mm, all marine mammals, because they're mammals, they have lungs and not gills, and therefore they need to breathe from the surface. And that's why their nose has migrated to the top of the head. We call it the nostril up here or the blowhole, all right? But they have lungs, and so they depend on breathing from the surface. Yes, Jose. Uh, just real quick on that uh, creature underneath animals. How do you know that's an animal? This one here? Right. Okay. But so first, first of all, it doesn't photosynthesize. Okay, it's, it doesn't have photosynthetic pigments. It doesn't have a photosynthetic color in the range of greens. And secondly, it tends to move around. And third, it doesn't have a cell wall <laughs> at the microscopic okay. level. So we got at least three lines of evidence just real quickly off the top of my head why it's not a plant, okay? okay. And it's trapping, you can see the tentacles are to trap animals and other little creatures floating around instead of feeding on, on, uh, on decaying material, so it's not a saprophyte. And then by the other th group is animals. Of course, if we were to do a DNA analysis on this guy, we'd find that it would be, uh, have a lot of homology, percentage homology with jellyfish and corals. Right. And, okay. and, um, and sea anemones and things like that. Okay? Right, okay, because it looks like a very small jellyfish, that's why it's yeah, actually, this is probably, it's uh, some kind of salenterate. Mm? And then you can see there's some compartmentalization here of the digestive system, which may have eventually give rise to the annelids. Annelids are the earthworm where they have segments in the body, ah. they have the rings mm -hmm. of the body, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. Different varieties of worms coming from here. Okay? Interesting. Okay, cool. And also able to go onto land because the salenterates, uh, the jellyfish and all those guys are uh, still bound to water. They, they need water to maintain the, the structure of their, of their bodies and for gas exchange. All right, so moving the film forward quite fast here, what do we have? We start with the prokaryotes at the base of the tree, this is a phylogenetic tree, right? Or a tree of life. We start with the prokaryotes at the base of the tree. This is moving forward in time, going up from the bottom in the precambium, precambrium, going back at least uh, half a billion years ago. Then uh, the branching of the eukaryotes from the prokaryotes. And then the further branching of the metazoans from the protozoans. So the protozoans would be typically unicellular, at most colonial. And eventually the metazoans are the ones that actually have 
organs inside of division of labor. So different organs within the body for division of labor. And further, this is known here, you notice the big branching and further, further branching in what is known as the Cambrian. So this is known as the Cambrian explosion. Oh, there it is, Cambrian explosion, right? Major phyla develop here uh, during this time. And so typically this represents also some kind of change in the atmosphere, in the conditions, significant drastic change that opens up new niches or new pockets of nature or where animals can diverge. So the general tendency is toward divergence, to having more variety, more variety. A very simple example, let's say you have parents of humans, right? And they have, let's say six or eight children, just to put a large number of children, so a large number of projects. When you look at those children, you look at those siblings, likely, unless they are monozygotic twins, unless they're identical twins, right? They're gonna be slightly different from each other, variation. First of all, there'll be variations. Some may be males, some may be females, but also some may be more blonde, some may be more brown eyes, some may be darker in skin, lighter in skin, different sizes, different shapes and so forth. So it's gonna be variation among the siblings, the F1 generation from just two parents, right? From one couple, that one couple, all those children are going to be variations of their parents. Some of those children will look more like the mother, some will look more like the father, etc. But you see, just in one generation, there's variation. Now you take those six siblings, marry them, and they each have their own six children. Now you got 36 grandchildren, right? Those 36 grandchildren, some are gonna be, so now you got siblings and you got cousins. There's gonna be even greater variation and so on and so forth. So you can fast forward that argument and the general tendency is toward branching out, toward variation. What it will cause that scientifically? Toward speciation, toward different species, even of the same genus or different genera from the same family and different families from the same order, different orders from the same class. And you can go up and down the tree, whichever way you want, as many times as you wanna go up and down the tree, but you're gonna find generally divergence with time. And that also, the more divergence, the more drastic changes in the atmosphere, the more there's gonna be extinction, but the extinction opens up new pockets, new niches, for greater divergence to establish, all right? And the most graphic example we have of that is when the dinosaurs were wiped out about 70 million years ago, more or less, those guys were so voracious that the mammals just didn't have a chance. The largest mammal probably around the time of the dinosaurs from the fossil record is little uh, mouse-like uh, creatures that look like little hot dogs with legs all right, tiny, those little mini wieners, and they would hide underneath the rocks to try to evade the huge dinosaurs that were eating just everything in sight, including each other. And so when the mammals were wiped out drastically, very interesting, we'll get to that, how they were wiped out. Uh, then there's, all of a sudden, the mice came out from under the rocks one day and they say, wow, look at this, no dinosaurs. Let's procreate and let's populate the earth. And so now we're in the age of the mammals. It also happened that the earth got cooler, so hair was more convenient and so on and so forth. So you can see, I mean, it's plausible, right? We say there's a logic to it. There's a logical explanation for this whole process of evolution, but we need a lot of time and a lot of patience. If we give time and patience, nature will do its thing. And the thing of nature is toward divergence, divergence, right? So here's an example of divergence. <laughs> Uh, just for, here's metazoa. Hope you can see it down there. Kind of small, but uh, let's uh, raise it a little bit. Yeah, here's the metazoans, right? These guys here. This is a simplistic uh, diagram, cladogram, simplistic, just showing the, the, the basic module nodes, this, uh, the main nodes, but this is a little more accurate. <laughs> Look at all the nodes. <laughs> 
they're all numbered. So we start at node 55, we end up at node 74 here, the more recent one, but if we move up, look at the nodes into the hundreds. Uh, I guess 107 is the, so 50 nodes, right? In other words, points of divergence from the original metasoan to the most recent uh, development here, the arthropods, which are, um, arthropods are things like uh, crabs, um, ticks, uh, insects, uh, butterflies, all those guys that have articulated legs. That's what I was looking for. They have articulated legs. Okay. They're the more sophisticated one on this diagram, on this uh, cladogram. So this is probably done by, phylo by yeah, phylogenetics of uh, percentage homology and where the nodes occur. Going back now at the bottom at the y-axis, if you will, all these things in code here. Here's a cambrium and you can see more or less the cambrium explosion, this CAM down here, between 541 and 485 million years ago, MA, million years. So about half a billion years ago, half a billion, we have this famous Cambrian explosion. You see here, there's a big explosion of um, biodiversity occurring here, in this general region. We can say we expanded back out a little bit to pick up this from 600 to 500 million years ago is where we have a large biodiversity occurring. And then things kind of stabilized for millions of years into the, these other mm, letters represent just the different geologic eras and epochs, you may have heard them. The Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous. The Carboniferous was another kind of explosion there, so forth. Uh, Triassic, Jurassic, right? It was Jurassic, Jurassic Park, right? Dinos, uh, that's their beginning. And then um, uh, Cretacean, Cretacean uh, 60 million. So around here, they got wiped out. And then we get into the Cenozoic. Uh, epoch here, Cenozoic, we're in the Cenozoic now, with the more recent one. These are the geologic eras or epochs, ending on the scale. And these are the dozen major phyla. Now that I made a mess out of this slide. Out of the three dozen phyla, these are the main phyla. Here we are, chordates. Chordate, meaning that we have a spinal cord and so forth. So, a couple of more. Wow, it's 11.30, I've been driving you very hard. <laughs> okay, we only have a couple more slides to do. So let's, uh, why don't we take a little break here and we're gonna pick up back at um, the theory of spontaneous generation going back and forth a little bit and uh, dealing with this because this was the prevailing theory up until the, mm, the Renaissance, which is when science began in earnest doing the scientific method of observation and experimentation, right? So the common belief, which was mostly from a naive understanding of the world around us, but also fed a lot by belief of the Judeo-Christian tradition. I'm talking mostly about the Northwestern hemisphere, mainly Europe and North America, but especially Europe. The Judeo-Christian tradition, including of course the Middle East, it was mostly just a naive interpretation of uh, the world around us, including life, nature, and how it was just naively thought that God was creating all these creatures that surround us by what is now labeled as spontaneous generation, that animals and plants and everything living just kind of arose spontaneously. So we're gonna address that. Let's take a little break uh, and we'll come back. So it's 11.30.
come back in about uh, 10 minutes. Is that okay? All right. Well, they say that mm -hmm. silence consents. I didn't hear no, that'll be fine. That'll be fine. <laughs> All right. So let me pause the recording and uh, we'll be back at around 11.40, okay? Thank you. Okay, hello, I hope uh, you can all still see the presentation here it's after the break. I had to go get some warm clothing from my office because it's freezing in here. I know why you're not coming to class because <laughs> it's freezing in here. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so pardon the attire with the scarf and all that. <clears throat> so we had left off with this whole issue of the <clears throat> biodiversity that has exploded over the millions of years into the about 2 million species that have been classified today which is considered to be only five to 10% of the actual species living on earth, right? So anywhere between 10 to 20 million species. <clears throat> Most of those are uh, obviously microscopic and most likely living at the bottom of the ocean. And that's why we haven't discovered them yet. But uh, periodically uh, there are new species that have been discovered. Fa Father, mm -hmm. yes. I have a question. Um, in this table that you show us, where you said there's notations, that means that they found 56. Cristina, give me a moment, please, because uh, your microphone in particular gets a lot of resonance. I don't know if maybe you're too close to it. Uh, is it your microphone on, on the computer, on the laptop, or you have a separate mic? For your... Do, do, well, I, I have it with my... Uh, headphones, I guess. I don't know. I really oh, am not very. It's a headphone. Really, yeah, her headphone. The volume on the uh, her headphone. Can you hear me better now? Lot. Can you okay. hear me better? So maybe try to lower the volume on your headphone. Because uh, it does create a lot of resonance and it's hard to. to, to do that for you. Can you hear me better? A little better. Try again. Just keep talking. I'm so oh, sorry. That's all right. Go ahead with your question. Go ahead. And, just... and, I'm, and I'm a loud person, so imagine that. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, I what, I was, what I wanted to ask, I mean, um, those notes that you said, the 56, the 60, the 59, oh. does that mean they had found evidence of 56 organisms that are classified that way, or what do they mean? What the 50s that you're referring to is- These numbers, the, uh, the, the numbers. Node number, the number of yeah. the node. Yeah, no, the number of the node is just sequential to identify for him. This is six, 55 here, right? Metazoans. And then 56 is over here. It's, a, it's another node of divergence. 57 is over here, 58, then 59 is probably down here. Yeah, there it is. So the numbers just represent a node, right? You know what a node is? It's a point of divergence in evolution. Now, what's interesting about this is that it gives you a time scale here. These different letters represent geo geologic time going back, for example, right now we are in the Cenozoic, C-E-N, Cenozoic. And before the Cenozoic was the Cretaceous, the K. Before the Cretaceous was the Jurassic. People are familiar with Jurassic, J-R. So this is going back in time. And then we can also put a, a time, we can put a number to that time so that we know that, uh, <clears throat> Where was it? Uh, there. So this is the time scale going back millions of years. So these nodes are just numbered sequentially so that we can refer to them, you know, number 57, node 95, node 74, et cetera. 
Now you notice also that many lines stop. That means there is an extinction, right? And there's a general species are being extinct all the time. I see there in the middle, it ends. So this main branch uh, becomes extinct by this period. Again, this is based mostly on the fossil record, right? But also the molecular percentage homology that can be figured out. So we have species that are becoming extinct all the time. And also new species are arising. So that's another example of a dynamic system. It's just that it's occurring in geologic time and that's why we don't see it right away with our, in our own lifetime. We see everything around us pretty stable. This, the number of species that are around us and so forth. Except for one case, in my opinion, which is the superbugs, the bacteria that have developed immunity to a spectrum of um, antibiotics, to a broad spectrum of antibiotics. Because bacteria reproduce so fast, like I say on the on their conditions, typically every 20 minutes, that you get a new generation with millions of bacteria right away. And all you need is one bacterium to be immune by a chance mutation, be immune to that antibiotic, then within 20 minutes, that bacterium is now reproducing and producing a progeny, and it will going to scale up exponentially. When we run that forward within days, we can get a whole colony of bacteria that are immune to this particular antibody, um, antibiotic. So we give a different antibiotic and then bacteria become immune to that also, you end up with bacteria that are immune to just about all of the antibiotics that we have. That's a very dangerous situation because then this bacteria is nothing that's gonna kill them. Anyway, so that's one example that I can see we can actually in our own lifetime, we can see evolution happening <laughs> in the super, they're called super bugs, right? Super bugs in, uh, in hospitals uh, typically. But anyway, I diverge from your question. Um, go back, Christina, for your question again, please, or your comment. It was perfect, Father, I understood, thank you. You got it, about the, not, the notes, yeah. Okay, let's look at this spontaneous generation then, unless there's something else, because this was kind of the standard uh, view back up until the scientific method started uh, to be applied in, with the Copernican revolution and basically the beginning of modern science about 500 years ago in Europe precisely, using also instrumentation. But the first key was just observation, observation. Okay? And uh, like I said, the standard was that species, I mean, <clears throat> when people looked around, obviously they saw other animals and plants that were living also and so forth, reproducing and uh, <clears throat> It looked like what's, what's again the naive sense, the naive sense when we look at species reproducing, when we look at species reproducing, the naive sense and, and the progeny look like the parents. The naive intuition is that, well, the species has always been the same. The species has always been because the children of the mice also look like mice and the children of the children also look like mice. And no matter how many, how many generations of mice do we have or flies, they all look like the ancestor, right? So there was no, there was no pointing at evolution in a particular time frame, which is our own time frame when we live. It's counter, evolution from that perspective is counterintuitive because when we look around, all the children of the animals and plants that we see are like, just like their parents. So where is the change, right? Where is the evolution? Okay, so this is just a couple of minutes. It explains the whole issue of spontaneous generation, how it was finally discredited, mostly by observation and experimentation. 
which is the core of the scientific method, again, mostly in Europe and the Middle East um, about 500 years ago. Prior to Charles Darwin, scientists had some rather strange ideas concerning how life began. They believed that living organisms came into being rapidly and spontaneously over a period of just a few weeks. The scientific community believed in spontaneous generation for 2,000 years. And it is a stark reminder that even a majority of scientists can be wrong. In his classic 17th century description of spontaneous generation, scientist Jan Baptist von Helmont suggested that mice came from dirty underwear. Wanneer je een stuk gedragen ondergoed, if you put a piece of sweaty underwear in an open mouth jar, together with a piece of wheat, after 21 days the ferment coming out of the underwear changed the wheat into mice. But what is even more amazing is that the mice are not small or aborted mice, but adult mice emerge. Another evidence offered for spontaneous generation was the rotting meat experiment. 17th century scientists observed that if meat was placed in an open jar, maggots formed on the meat weeks later. They conjectured that life, in the form of maggots, arose spontaneously from rotting meat. But in 1668, Francesco Redi, an Italian physician and scientist, overturned this idea. He suggested this proof of spontaneous generation was nothing more than contamination of the meat by flies. When flies landed on the rotting meat, they laid their eggs. Over time, these eggs grew into maggots. Later, the maggots changed into flies. When Scientist Ready prevented flies from landing on the meat with a piece of cheesecloth, maggots never formed. Okay. So you see the basic uh, tool of observation and experimentation. Ready, Francesco Ready, who was a doctor, a medical doctor, was observing and say, well, why should we assume that the meat, the rotten meat just turned into maggots, which then became flies? Could it be that we're not seeing the microscopic eggs that the flies are uh, dropping in, in the rotten meat, <laughs> and when those eggs <clears throat> hatch, they uh, eventually the maggot will grow from there, right? So the alternative was this uh, process of evolution, which can be defined or summarized as descent with modification. Descent with modification. So the whole issue is on the variation, the variation because nature will select on variation. Some variations are better adapted than other variations. So selection is always going to be a process of selecting out the variant that is least adapted. That's a, a statistical thing on average, we say on average. The ones that are selected out are the ones that are less adapted. Okay, and that's what we call natural selection. So, we can uh, thank Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel for this mechanism, even though, like I mentioned in the first lecture, they didn't know each other and so forth, but still Darwin proposes a theory of evolution, sounds out the bombshell, and Mendel actually gives us the mechanism for that evolution at the molecular level, which Mendel didn't know yet because we simply did not have knowledge of the molecular structure of DNA, but he calls them, Mendel calls them inheritance factors, right? Inheritance factors, he puts it in the context of one generation to the next, one generation to the next. So what is being passed on is precisely that genetic material. Now, so spontaneous generation doesn't work, this is proven. The alternative is this evolution process, which I have been explaining to you in this whole uh, process from starting from the archaea, right? The archaea, the stromatolites, uh, about 4 billion years ago, all the way down to 
the phylogenetic tree that we have today of the dozen major phyla plus two, uh, two dozen more, about a total of three dozen phyla classified today of biodivergence. So you notice that the lecture was the origin and development of life on earth. But I have uh, kind of pulled a fast one on you in the sense that so far I've been talking mostly about the development of life on earth, right? From primitive organisms like archaea all the way down to the biodiversity that we see around us today about 4 billion years ago. But what's the elephant in the room? <laughs> The elephant in the room is the actual origin of the life. In other words, professor, where did those archaea come from? <laughs> Were they perhaps sent in by spontaneous generation or did they fly in from another planet? <laughs> right? So the elephant in the room uh, uh, is how did life itself, organic life arise on earth around four billion years ago, when we started having a crust with liquid water. So that's what I'm gonna address now. And what we need to do now is enter Carol Urey, Urey, and Stanley Miller, right? Dr. Urey already uh, had a Nobel, uh, had already won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for, um, he was working on deuterium, which is one of the isotopes of hydrogen during the Second World War. And then the other isotope of hydrogen is tritium, right? Uh, we have deuterium has two um, neutrons and tritium has three neutrons and is radioactive. And that was the beginning of the development of the H-bomb, otherwise known as the atomic bomb. <laughs> okay, so Yure and other scientists at the time were involved in the, the 40s, 30s and 40s, on the chemical side of uh, the studies that eventually led to the uh, nuclear bomb. He was teaching, I think it was at Chicago, University of Chicago in the 50s, late 40s, early 50s. And one of his graduate students, Stanley Miller, he was a real go-getter. And they're looking at the primitive atmosphere. So it's all related to uh, chemistry, molecules, gases, for example, the primitive atmosphere that had high hydrogen, H2 diatomic, which is highly explosive. And uh, <clears throat> so they're looking at the primitive atmosphere and Miller, the graduate student, has this idea of reconstructing the primitive atmosphere and trying to energize that primitive atmosphere, which is mostly, like I mentioned, CO2, ammonia, and uh, methane. So ammonia is NH3, methane is CH4, and nitrogen, just diatomic nitrogen and carbon dioxide. <clears throat> you notice that all of these molecules, they have either carbon or hydrogen, but not together. Therefore, they're not carbohydrates, okay? Well, yeah, methane is, sorry. Methane is a carbohydrate, but the others are not. CO2 is not a carbohydrate, and two, uh, ammonia. <clears throat> so the, the big question was, how can we get organic compounds from inorganic compounds? From non-organic compounds, how can we get organic compounds? Because it turns out that all life is made up of these organic compounds, these four organic compounds, right? So these organic compounds, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and amino acid, I mean, um, sorry, Got it wrong here, nucleic acids. Ooh. Amino acids are the protein. <laughs> right, so <clears throat> these four organic molecules, four groups, 
is what makes up life, chemically speaking. Chemically speaking, you know that we can reduce life, if you will, to chemical reactions that occur in an orderly fashion instead of random, in an orderly fashion. And that's what we call metabolism. It occurs in every cell of the body that is alive. And then those cells working together make the tissues, the organs, et cetera. So proteins, for example, uh, enzymes are proteins, okay? Lipids are, examples of lipids are greases, fats, oils, uh, waxes, uh, stuff that is non-soluble in water generally. Those are lipids. Many of our tissue needs lipids for staying alive and even for uh, storing energy. The carbohydrates are mostly sugars and star starches. Cellulose also is a carbohydrate. And then finally, the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, because they are in the nucleus of the cell. Okay. <clears throat> So how can we obtain, is it possible to obtain organic molecules, which are much more complex from inorganic molecules? Is it possible? Because it is evident that the primitive uh, earth and atmosphere had already inorganic compounds, right? Uh, it had all kinds of material atoms and molecules that have been picked up and formed with the accretion process, for example. Uh, one of the most abundant, if not the most abundant element on earth is um, iron, iron, ferrum. And that's why we exert this uh, type of gravity because it's fairly dense compared to other, other elements. So that just happens to be the iron that we picked up from flying stuff. And uh, so the core is iron and nickel, the core of, uh, of the earth. Okay, back to Urey and Miller. So Stanley Miller wants to reproduce the primitive atmosphere and then zap it. In other words, uh, create, try to mimic lightning, which was occurring. It was assumed that in the primitive atmosphere was pretty violent. When not only was it full of toxic gases that were coming out of the, from underneath the crust of the earth from the magma, the gases that were being released from there, but also the electrical charges that were occurring in the atmosphere. And it is assumed there was a lot of lightning and storms going up, going off. Uh, so it's pretty nasty environment, okay? And Miller wanted to uh, recreate this in the lab on the control conditions. And you say, be my guest, go ahead and do it. And so they did what is now known as the famous Stanley uh, Miller Urey experiment. Hmm? The Miller Urey experiment was done in the 50s, early 50s. And the bottom line about that experiment is that they were able to produce amino acids and other organic compounds from inorganic compounds, from inorganic gases, from the primitive, uh, mimicking the primitive atmosphere. So it's a little film on this also. Uh, goes on for about five minutes. It explains the whole process of the Ure Miller experiment. Here we go. In 1871, Charles Darwin speculated in a letter to a friend that a warm little pond might be life's birthplace. A warm soup of chemicals bathed by energy from the sun would have been, well, comfortable for molecules to come together in new ways and create life. Darwin was way, way ahead of his time. Uh, a nice little warm soup is going to get you a long way. Jeff Bada of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego has spent his career working to understand the early Earth's soup of chemicals. He began under the direction of perhaps the most famous scientist in origin of life research, Stanley Miller. 
there are in the history of science turning points where we suddenly see the history of Earth and life differently. In the early 1950s, Stanley Miller, the eager graduate student, and Harold Urey, the Nobel Prize winning mentor at the University of Chicago, conducted this astonishing experiment where they'd made an early Earth environment. It looks like this sort of a Frankenstein type apparatus, but actually it's a very carefully thought out design. Uh, just uh, stop for a moment. There is a little film clip here from the movie, original movie, Frankenstein. In my opinion, it's a little over the top, but uh, anyway, it's part of the movie. It's just very brief, and uh, you'll see it coming up eventually. Bada sets up a modern day test of the 1950s experiment on Miller's original lab equipment. One flask contains water. That's to simulate the ocean. The other flask has just got the gases in it. So this is the atmosphere. Just as it does in nature, water from the ocean evaporates and rises into the atmosphere, where it condenses and returns to the ocean. Miller simulated what he believed to be the atmosphere of early Earth with different gases, like ammonia and methane. Then, he added a spark of genius. Miller and Urey decided to use a spark to simulate lightning because that's such a ubiquitous process in the atmosphere of the Earth. That was the real inspiration, these little electric sparks. They acted like simulated lightning. The energy from the spark of lightning breaks down the gas and water molecules so they can undergo further chemical reactions. To their astonishment, when they turned this apparatus on, after only a couple of days, you started seeing this pink color developing. And then a few more days, black oily goo is forming around the electrodes. The electrodes get covered with new substances, organic compounds usually associated with life. And it wasn't just any organic compound. It was amino acids that make proteins the ingredients for life. Amino acids are the building blocks of life. They form proteins, which are the key component of muscles and other tissues. People thought, aha, this is a key step in the origin of life. And you really believe that you can bring life to the dead? That body is not dead. It has never lived. I created it. The experiment raised the fear that a Frankenstein creation like in this classic film, was just around the corner. People were saying they made Frankenstein in a test tube. It's alive! It's alive! Oh, I know what it feels like to be gone. Had Miller and Yuri cooked up life in a test tube? Many of the news headlines were saying life created in the laboratory, life created in, the, in a test tube. Well, of course, that was wrong. The real news was that he made these compounds that are part of life. Okay, so that experiment of um, the Yuri Miller experiment is now a classic. It's been about 70 years and it has been reproduced many times in many different labs throughout the world, even changing because there has been a, a more refined understanding of the primitive atmosphere. It, has, it had the, the proportions of the gases and so forth, but invariably when that experiment is run forward, 
we get these organic compounds forming from the originally inorganic compounds, right? And uh, the, one of the major ones are these amino acids of which there are 20 uh, essential amino acids that occur in nature. And between these 20 amino acids coming together, they are the building blocks of proteins. Now proteins themselves are like the workhorse of the cell. Proteins, there are thousands of different proteins. There are polymers uh, that are long and they twist in a three-dimensional shape. And that's what makes them active is their actual shape. And so proteins are the ones that accomplish most of the work in cells, what we call otherwise metabolism, because these proteins are in charge of allowing these chemical reactions to occur in our body in an orderly fashion, in an orderly fashion, what we call a cascade from one product to another, like taking, for example, digestion. We need enzymes for digestion, right? So that whole process of breaking down the food so that it's in particles that's small enough to be absorbed and then transported through our circulatory system into our tissues and so forth. All that is mostly regulated by proteins. And that's why they are a major component of what we call life, which uh, chemically is uh, metabolism. So I'm able to, to, to look at the possibility of having life evolve originally from just chemicals, inorganic compounds that were on the surface of the earth, either mixed in the oceans or part of the atmosphere okay, as gases. There would be at least three, seven steps. These three, seven steps that I have uh, summarized here to try to arrive at a living cell. Mm -hmm. So we start with inorganic molecules like uh, hydrogen, CO2, stuff that would be coming out of the volcanoes and that has also mixed in to the water, the oceans, just by uh, solubility, by being dissolved into that little soup, the primitive soup. Mm -hmm. And these steps, so the first passage would be precisely from inorganic molecules to organic molecules, small, simple organic molecules through this process uh, as the uh, Urey uh, Miller experiment. Then the next step is to take those simple organic molecules and start polymerizing them. In other words, it's like uh, the trains of, a, of uh, the, the wagons on a train to link them together and to end up with a larger molecule, what we call a macromolecule, made up of smaller subunits. That's what we call polymers. The interesting thing about polymers is that not only are they larger, sometimes containing thousands or, or even millions or billions of atoms, as in the case of DNA, but the polymer then can uh, assume a three-dimensional shape, and that three-dimensional shape will then have, it can uh, have a particular function. The particular function that I'm thinking of is called the lock and key model, and that's again how enzymes work. Let me show you. It's the actual shape, the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme that makes it work on a substrate. So uh, lock and key. It's an analogy, right? So this is the uh, substrate. Actually, it's a little better diagram here. This is a substrate that is made up of these two subunits. And this is the enzyme the substrate fits into the enzyme or the enzyme into the substrate as a lock and key model, just like the key turns the bolt in, uh, in the lock and unlocks the door, right? So the enzyme 
uh, attaches to the substrate and through a controlled chemical reaction is able to break the substrate into the two subunits. So this would be a process example of digestion, this larger piece of food, and now it's getting smaller so that it can be absorbed by the intestines, just one example. The process can go either way. As a whole, it's called metabolism. And metabolism is subdivided into either building up or breaking down. So if it's breaking down, as in this process, breaking down one molecule, one larger molecule into smaller, it's called catabolism, C-A, catabolism, C-A-T-A. Or if it's putting two molecules together, two or more molecules together into assembling them into one, it's called anabolism. So anabolism builds and catabolism breaks. Those are the, the two, the reaction could go in either way, depending on the enzyme, depending on the substrate and the particular metabolic process. I think here's an illustration. All right. These are two substrates coming together into an enzyme and the enzyme locks them together. So this would be a, an example of anabolism. If it's being breaking up, then it's catabolism. Anyway, uh, we can talk about life organically as metabolic processes. And the vast majority of these processes are controlled by enzymes or by proteins in the body, thousands and thousands of different types of proteins. Proteins are also involved structurally in uh, organelles and other uh, tissues, like for example, muscle and so forth. They, the polymers slide in between each other and allow the tissue as a whole to move as in the case of muscle. So proteins are very, very useful. They are the workhorse of uh, life, of the cell and of tissues. So basically what we have, oh, sorry, I was uh, in the diagram here, yeah. So when we get to the polymers then, these polymers are able to do certain functions, specific functions uh, within cells or in a, uh, in a soup condition, we are here as before we get to the actual cell, right? Next to each other. Then what happens? Polymers also have another characteristic is that they can self replicate because you have cycles. A cycles in nature, for example, a cycle in nature could be day or night. Another cycle, which is a short cycle of 24 hours, or it could be a longer cycle of uh, wet and dry which could be a year, a rainy season, dry season. That's a whole year cycle, all right? Or you can have a medium term cycle like the tide, the ebb and the flow of tide on the shore, depositing some water and then that water dehydrating, shrinking, uh, pulling the, the polymers together. And then a new tide comes in and rehydrates the whole uh, pool, uh, pond. And then those molecules, those uh, polymers will expand and so forth. So, there's a cycling that occurs in nature naturally. That cycling may lead to the polymers duplicating themselves or replicating. So another fancy word for duplication is replication. Uh, I think I had another little video. Hold on a second, because I have another video of these uh, mm, protobionts and these, uh, self-replicating molecules that are not life. They're just little drops of oil or something like that. Different compounds, and they can start interacting with each other. They're moving uh, randomly, uh, but they exhibit characteristics that are normally associated with life, precisely like motion. Just need to drill in here. It's a little sheet that I have. Be patient with me. Here we go. A couple in particular, yes. Uh, polymerization. This is how polymers may come to be 
just uh, spontaneously or on their own. Uh, canceled. A minute to get back in there. Okay, Let's see if they were still active. Quasivate molecules exhibit certain life like characteristics. Not long, but you'll see. Okay, this doesn't have any speech on it, but you can see the, he's applying just electricity to this little dots or of chemicals. You see how they start uh, reacting and eventually they start fusing together. Mm -hmm. They start fusing together. See, just by applying a small electrical charge they start attracting to each other and then they fuse. So this could be the beginning of endosymbiosis, right? They start aggregating. These are just chemicals with an electrical current and electrical charge. which could happen in nature. This is under fluorescence. So it's showing a similar process. Just to say that molecules and compounds, even if they are inorganic compounds can be made to exhibit certain lifelike characteristics like clumping and moving and so forth and um, absorbing each other that would be in a cellular situation will be called phago phagocytosis which is eating up other cells and uh, here phagocytosis a a phago is a reference to eat or phago eating up other cells. And these are synthetic protocells. In other words, these cells are, are not alive. They're called, I mean, they're not, um, they're not living cells. This one is induced by magnetism. How this, this little black compound starts eating up other things, other little chemicals that are in its past. And the stimulant here is just a magnetic field, which again can occur in nature. You know, some uh, metals are magnetized. So this is just uh, various evidence of how folks are playing, if you will, with some um, inorganic compounds to see if they will exhibit lifelike uh, qualities like movement, eating up other things in the neighborhood, uh, conglomerating and so forth. Then there's another one that is actually a split where applying a certain, um, environmental conditions, one clump will split into two and start rotating around each other and then split it to again and so forth. So it's pointing toward the possibility of uh, cellular reproduction. There's another one, it's a little longer, this TED talk. I'll send you the link, you can watch it uh, on your own. Mm. Yes, this one here, 14, it's 15 minutes long, so 
I don't want to take time now, but uh, I'll send you the link so you can watch it. It's, it's very well done. This uh, chemist that is playing with these cells, these protocells that exhibit lifelike qualities. So it's at the boundary <laughs> between life and non-life. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we have with these seven steps? I think I left halfway through. Yeah, the self-replication is another characteristic going toward life. Mm -hmm. And this could be uh, lead to the genomes. In other words, the uh, molecules of uh, inheritance, which are polymers, DNA, obviously it's a polymer, it's a chain of repetition of nucleotides. Another step would be compartmentalization that I mentioned earlier. In other words, making these pockets within the protocells, what they call the protocells, uh, making pockets so that each pocket will specialize into doing something particular. Once we get to this compartmentalization, then what we have in fact is what has been known as uh, protocells or protobionts. Protobionts are the precursors of an actual living cell of, the, of something biological, something living, all right, of the biomes. So these protobionts or protocells are exhibiting some of the basic characteristics of life, which are gonna be at the end of the day, there are two fundamental characteristics for life, which is metabolism, body, func body functioning or cellular functioning and reproduction, generating another one like itself, generating another cell like itself. Okay? Those are the two basic characteristics of life, metabolism, and reproduction. Another step is linking the genotype with the phenotype. So here are two key words that are technical again. We'll see them in more detail uh, next semester at the beginning of life. But basically the genotype is the genetic information in our genes, in our DNA. That's the genotype. The phenotype is the expression, pheno, it's a reference to the body, to the expression of the genotype. And I can tell you basically there is a transition from DNA to proteins. In other words, DNA code for proteins. I mentioned earlier that the proteins are the ones that do the work in the body, but those proteins, the code for making that protein, the amino acid sequence is encoded in the DNA. So basically what the DNA has is the code of amino acid sequences that make for a functional protein, for a functional protein, right? And that's what we mean linking the, the genotype to the phenotype. In other words, a code, a genetic code that may express a particular protein for metabolism, for metabolism in a living cell. So that's the next step. Here we think that the, so I mentioned the genotype is, uh, contains the genetic code. And it is thought that the origin of the genetic code was not DNA, but RNA, RNA instead, which is a ribonucleic acid. So again, for illustration, let's go there. Just so that you see the molecules. See, this is DNA, which is a double helix, right? It's a twisted ladder and it's stable because it has been stabilized by the steps of the ladder linking up to each other, the linking up. But RNA is not stable because it's a single ladder. It's not a double ladder, it's a single ladder, it's a single rail. It's a little bit like those tube ladders, I don't know if you've seen, it's just a pole with the steps of the ladder sticking out in a circular fashion, in a spiral fashion, but the steps are actually sticking out, right? And so unless we put a little rail on those steps, it's dangerous because one could just fly out of the ladder taking a step from one step to the other. And so DNA, uh, RNA, ribonucleic acid, is not as stable as DNA because it's a single rail. 
And because it's a single rail, it flips around and twists, and sometimes it hairpins onto itself to try to stabilize itself. Okay. Uh, the coronavirus, by the way, is an RNA virus. Okay, these are because the influenza viruses, the flu-like viruses are RNA viruses. They're called retroviruses instead of DNA. And that's why it mutates so much because RNA is more unstable than DNA, it's less stable. Mm -hmm. And so RNA tends to mutate more, easy, more easily and generate more variants. And that's why we're getting all the variants of the uh, Renovirus of the um, coronavirus because it's an RNA virus. All influenza viruses are, are RNA viruses. So uh, going back to the steps, then the genetic code. We think that originally was RNA because there are so many different types of RNAs now. No sense uh, going into the detail, but basically there are many different types of RNAs in the cell, but there's only generally one DNA, which is in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And so it is thought that double-stranded DNA, DS, double-stranded DNA developed from single-stranded DNA. The single strand is just a reference to a single rail on the ladder, whereas double strand is a reference of the double ladder, of the two, two rails on the ladder. And so well, we have a possible transition from RNA, if it started as an RNA world before the DNA, and then when the RNA is starting to stabilize itself, it became eventually could become DNA, especially if we change uracil to thymine. And that can be done by methylating uracil. It's a little too technical. It's, uh, it's chemical language, but basically there's a process by which we can turn RNA into uh, DNA. It has to be manipulated chemically. Finally, the last step, once we do have DNA in place in the primitive cell, then that DNA is so effective in holding the genetic code and transmitting it as a package, essentially as a DNA molecule in the chromosome system, that now we have a universal molecule of inheritance. This DNA works for whatever species. All we need to do is change the sequence, the genetic sequence, the genes, and we get a different species, but a different species that can live, that is, that is alive. And so it's all in the variation and that variation can be caused by mutations, mutations on the DNA, which in principle are random mutations. So we can see that in seven steps, we can go from what is originally inorganic compounds, simple molecules and compounds that we find on the surface of the earth, even on land, on the sea or in the atmosphere and combine them, adding energy sources like lightning or, or heat or ultraviolet radiation and so forth. And it may lead eventually through each one of these steps to an actual uh, living cell that is functioning, that is metabolizing and that is able to reproduce itself and make another one, the next generation like itself because the genetic code is, uh, or the, is uh, encoded, the next generation is encoded in that uh, DNA molecule. These different steps have been reproduced or have been generated in different labs of the world. What uh, up until now anyway, I just heard a uh, news from one of you that perhaps uh, these steps have now been put together but uh, up until, as far as I know, these, no one has been able to put all the seven steps together. Like I say, different labs of the world have worked on several of these steps, okay? But as far as I know, no one has been able to go all the way through the seven steps and end up with an actual living cell. Mm -hmm. 
but the separate steps have been done in uh, different labs of the world over time, especially in the recent decades where we have more sophisticated instrumentation and especially to try to measure this because this is all at the microscopic level, many times at the molecular level. So to measure it and to quantify it is uh, rather difficult, okay? But in principle, with these seven steps occurring, we could end up with uh, life. And it is thought that this is actually what happened in that primitive soup somewhere, either at the depths of the oceans with what is known as the uh, hydrothermal vents, which would be basically volcanic activity underneath the ocean, pouring out map magma but uh, but magma coming out from the bottom of the ocean from the crust and you can imagine this is a very toxic situation with all the gases and, uh, and molecules that are coming out of there and high heat but the heat could be an alternative source of energy because obviously down here is very dark. There's no light, there's no photosynthesis, but there could be chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis would be bacteria that live in this area. And their energy source is heat instead of light to start doing, to start putting together chemical compounds. And then there are other Mm, small animals that feed on those bacteria and then larger animals that feed on the smaller animals. So scientists have discovered down here uh, a whole mm, plethora of uh, life and uh, let's see. Just these uh, hydrothermal vents are very interesting. We have volcanic activity just coming out of the ocean. Bottom. In 1977, the discovery of hydrothermal vents releasing hot, mineral-rich water at the bottom of the ocean changed our understanding of the world as we know it. We had thought all life depended on sunlight to survive, but these vents showed us we have so much more to learn. Today, Hydrothermal vents of all kinds continue to be found in areas of known volcanic activity across the ocean. There it is. Oh my God. Oh, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit, but uh, it's fascinating how we get a whole life system that is totally independent of light. ...to energy, much like plants convert sunlight during photosynthesis. Uh, these uh, animals... This process of converting... They, they feed on bacteria, okay? And once uh, you get up on Chemicals the scale, to energy became known as chemosynthesis and redefined science as we know it. Move forward a little bit here. I'll send you these links so that you can watch them in detail. And these are the submarines that go down there. Done. They're not manned because there's so much pressure that it's uh, very dangerous to go down there. Uh, that way, you don't have to worry about chambers of maintaining uh, life uh, inside the chamber. Just send basically cameras and light. It's interesting to do a whole ecosystem that develops in total darkness, even with fish and crabs and everything else. Uh, walking around. Degrees Celsius, but it does not boil because of the immense pressure. It's amazing that life can thrive under these conditions in the midst of scalding hot water, immense pressure, and near freezing ocean depths. Yeah, within a few centimeters, you go from mm, scalding hot water to frigid water. The average temperature at the bottom of the ocean, it's about four degrees centigrade, right? Four degrees, so we're talking about maybe 34 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, or 30, 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and within a few centimeters, you go from that to about 200 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit, uh, right next to the vents. Anyway, very interesting, fascinating stuff that has been discovered. So there you have the five, the seven steps 
seven possible steps for generating life, beginning with just inorganic compounds, minerals. That's pretty much uh, what I have for today as the origin and development of life. You see that this experiment was the key experiment in the 50s to be able to generate those compounds experimentally. And now we can say that we have actually looked at the origin and development of life on earth. All right, questions, comments? I have one question about the assignment, Father. Yes. Um, do, when we do our summary, do you want us to combine the book with class? Yes, go ahead and integrate it. And of course, uh, you know that uh, Meyer goes into much more luxury of detail than I do and so forth, but stick to the outline, stick to the outline. All right, and this is basically what I'm looking for. And you can use the book to supplement the basic flow, but I'm basing the, you should base the, sum, the summaries primarily on the lecture and then use the textbook to supplement that summary. Okay, but I certainly don't expect the level of detail that he has because then it's no longer a summary, right? Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Well, I have one question. It may, yes. may be a little crazy, but anyways. Um, so we, everything happened in water and started evolving that way? Yes, thank you, because water is basic. Water, in fact, even to this day, our bodies are mostly water. We're about 80 to 90% water, just pure H2O. So that soup that uh, we're talking about of life is still occurring today at the cellular level. Even for us animals and plants that live outside of the water, technically speaking, we live outside the ocean, we're on land, right? Plants and animals and fungi. Internally, we have a liquid environment internally because our cells are about 90% water. And that's why that chemical soup is still going on today inside each one of our cells. When we take the water out, essentially we dehydrate the cell. When we dehydrate the cell, we're interfering with the chemical reactions that are occurring there. And we basically mess up the metabolism. So life is still water-based. And that's also why when uh, astronomers are looking beyond the earth into other planets, what are they looking for? They're looking for the possibility of liquid water because that could be a key that there may be life there or the potential for developing life if there's liquid water. But then also we preface that statement with saying at least life as we know it, because the only life that we know on earth is water-based and it's also carbon-based, a reference to the uh, organic mo molecules, the organic compounds. That makes sense? So one more question, Father. I actually two more. <clears throat> yeah, please. So in reference to bacteria, yeah. when we talk about bacteria and and you get sick and they said, well, you have a bacteria. Is that what it is? It's like you have instead of a virus. Are we talking about this kind of things that we we study today? With a virus? I didn't no, 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 no. I'm talking like there's there's viruses and there's bacteria. And sometimes yes. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, our bodies in, its, in, in itself. Right. Sometimes they said, no, you have a bacteria. It's, oh, yes. Okay, it's, so if you're talking about essentially infections of our body, we actually are also a colony. You know, there are many cells in our body that don't belong to us. We are host to bacteria and sometimes even viruses. But there's a crucial distinction between bacteria and virus, okay? Because bacteria are living and because they, they exhibit the two basic characteristics of life, which are metabolism and reproduction. So bacteria normally, naturally in their environment, they metabolize and they reproduce. Viruses are different. First of all, viruses are much smaller than bacteria. You know, in a single cell, a human cell, for example, uh, you can fit thousands of bacteria. Uh, 
but in a single bacterium, you can fit thousands of viruses. <laughs> so viruses are much, much smaller and viruses lack the two essential characteristics of life. Viruses do not metabolize. They're just fixed unless they're infecting a cell, viruses don't metabolize. And viruses don't reproduce on their own either. That's why viruses have to uh, sequester, they have to hijack, they have to infect a living cell. Because what they do is they hijack the reproductive machinery of the cell, of the host cell. The virus essentially injects either a DNA or an RNA code, and that DNA or RNA code uh, integrates to the DNA of the cell and fools the cell into thinking that that's part of its own DNA. And so the replication machinery reads that DNA, the virus DNA, as if it were part of the cell. And by doing that, it reproduces more viruses, thousands of more viruses, until the cell is so much full of viruses that the cell explodes, we call it lysis. But viruses actually are more close to a crystal than they are to a living organism because they're just basically a molecule of DNA or RNA enclosed in a capsule of protein. And sometimes they also have a lipid layer on top of that, like the coronavirus. That's why it's important to wash your hands with the soap because it dissolves that lipid layer. But basically it's just a capsule of chemicals, but it's not metabolizing uh, and it's not reproducing by itself. So we make a big distinction, but we can get infected by the virus. So um, bacteria will cause one type of infection, which typically is uh, treated by antibiotics because antibiotics kill bacteria, but antibiotics do nothing to the virus. The chemicals that we would have to take to kill a virus, to destroy a virus are so harsh that they will kill the host, you know? like radiating it with, with uh, ultraviolet radiation or something like that. That's what will kill the virus. That's what will destroy a virus. So those chemicals are so harsh and so toxic that they will kill the host, meaning the human being. So what do we do? We have to allow the body, the human body to kill the virus. And the body will do that because our cells, our immune system will attack the virus and destroy it. But it does that chemically, all right? All we need to do is, uh, encourage the immune system and support the immune system. And that's what the vaccines do. They, they encourage, they help the immune system, assist the immune system in killing that virus. Make sense? Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, so again, we have a large uh, range and variety of uh, backgrounds. Uh, so everyone brings a particular expertise on um, all different sites. So my apologies for the medical doctors when this gets a little too fundamental, too basic. My apologies to the priests when the, the theology is a little too fundamental or basic, but basically we're trying to gather a little bit from every field um, to put together the big picture, okay? Folks, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, your time and your presence. So now, uh, unless there are any other questions or comments, I'm gonna close down. Okay, one quick last comment. Yes, please. Um, it seems that uh, accretion occurred as per your timeline or per the timelines presented generally at around 4.5 billion years. Yes. And life began um, either less than a billion years later, or maybe one billion years later. Yeah, on the outside. Yeah. The do do the timelines in either uh, strata or geographic or fossil validate that that as a timeline from just a simple molecular event where a, an organic compound was created that in a billion years later, we'd have complex life? Yes, uh, so we have at least two lines of evidence that I presented today. One was the dating of the stromatolites yeah. to this time frame here, about half a million years after accretion, right? And that's by a fossil 
that is real and can be measured uh, by the half-life of uh, your uh, trace uranium and so forth. And the other one is that actually the timeline is at the other end of the thing. Within hours, the Uri Miller experiment right. was yeah. already getting organic compounds, was getting amino acids within hours of the formation. So you fast forward that to centuries, to millennia, to millions of years. Imagine how many more organic compounds and further development could happen, right? So that's why this seven steps here is entirely plausible. Okay. So accretion was the, the nascent component of accretion from the Ura Miller would have started almost simultaneously with the development of the crust. Well, no, accretion is a reference to it's right. a process to, to, of bringing together the earth as a material body, right? celestial body, okay? But I that accretion had to stop. In other words, the yeah. bombardment of stuff had to stop for the earth to be stable enough to actually generate a crust and to cool down enough also. So we had to lose enough heat, dissipate enough heat for the outer layer of that ball of magma, uh, red hot magma to cool down enough to create a crust. And that crust itself cooled down enough to have liquid water. So that's the key is right. the liquid water, all right? Cool. To have the soup. <laughs> okay. But it's a gradual process, it's a gradual process. But the evidence, even if it's indirect, does point in the direction of the, of the timing. Of course, when we go further into the development, as in this uh, cladogram here, right. you can see that the timeline, of course, this is only less than 1 billion years, right? But uh, we see that we can trace the metazoans back to less than a, a billion years. So that means that for the other 3 billion years, we're basically going from one single cell to the metazoan stage. In other words, from... Uh, from the archaea to the bacteria, from the bacteria to the cyanobacteria, from the cyanobacteria to endosymbiosis, endosymbiosis to colonization or uh, body functioning, division of labor, and eventually diversification. So I'm giving you a very crunched synopsis of right. the whole process. Now we need to, with our mind, expand it into four billion right. years. <laughs> So the, the Uri Miller experiments would would those have been have they been reproduced at a thermal temperature that would have been consistent with the temperature of that very early time? Because I'm looking at these uh, volcanoes under the Earth spewing out two thousand degrees, right? And I'm thinking more early Earth was like that with crust than it was uh, just a, a hot soup. Yes, uh, the only difference is, or uh, one difference that comes to mind just spontaneously like this is that whereas you know that water retains heat, right? Mm -hmm. So the hemothermal vents are going to maintain that layer of heat uh, for quite some time compared to the atmosphere where gases don't retain much heat at all, they will dissipate much easier. So what I'm trying to say is that the crust will that cool down faster than the hemothermal vents or the water surrounding that vent, simply because in the atmosphere, we do have water, but it's water vapor dissipates heat much faster. So the crust would have cooled down much faster than the rate at which these hemothermal vents are, are cooling. Yes, yeah, so I'm just thinking back to Genesis and formation of water and then land. Okay, uh, good. Yeah. We're gonna make that link. You, you okay. need to give me about two or more, three more lectures. Got it. <laughs> all right, until we make the link. But then what we're gonna do in the second half of the course, we're gonna pick up Genesis precisely and go chapter by chapter and verse by verse, especially chapter one, and go from let there be light, uh, big bang, right. Right. to uh, man and woman, all right, in his image. Okay. <laughs> all right, good. Thank you, Father. And yeah. thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Very interesting, fascinating, crazy for me. Interesting, eh? Crazy. Just presenting mm -hmm. possibilities. Possibilities. <laughs>
So if you have a conversation with a, a priest or you know somebody who might have theology and you start saying this is the possibility of the origin of life, are right. they is the I know is the church um in general accepting this as a real possibility? Yes, in I fact, mean, I'm, um, was, I'm, I'm just interested about that. Yeah, I'll send you a document also. It was John Paul II who actually made a declaration. I think it was uh, 1995, around there in the 1990s, that we as a whole, the Catholic Church does not have a problem with evolution, the process, because evolution talks about a process, okay? Uh, as long as it doesn't question the possibility of the existence of God, all right? So if we low, if leave open the possibility of the existence of God, then we have no problem with the process of evolution as such, as an organic process on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that a lot, yes. We'll, we'll I mean... get there too, we'll get there too. <laughs> That's a, that it's very important that we're not fundamentalistic. That's the key, you know, so that we don't take that Genesis 1 literally as uh, the first day, the second day, the third day, as a day of 24 hours, but rather as a day of a time period. Then we can fit geologic time in there. <laughs> okay, I'm giving you the latter lectures early. <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Okay. Bye-bye, all. God bless you all. Bye. Thank you all. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>